I think we are in this new regime. I don't think central banks have a better handle on what's to come next. This is about inflation coming in better and the Fed adjusting as a result. What we learned from the Fed is that we have to start entertaining our bull case a little bit more. I think Jerome Powell is fixated on delivering this soft landing. I've been calling for a softish landing. Now I think I just have more conviction in that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Can we say the year is over? Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance from New York City. Uh, this good morning. This is uh, Bloomberg Surveillance. Uh, Tom and John are both off today, hoping to get prepared for the holiday season. Tom is helping John shop for bow ties. John is helping Tom decorate his tree. The good news for everyone is that I am joined by two amazing people, Katie Greifeld, Damian Sassauer, who are going to join me around the table for the last day of the year. Can we say that, Katie, that this is the last sort of I week of the so. year? I mean, this was billed as the last week that mattered. We what, had so many central bank decisions. I know we have some data coming next week, but I think Thank we can you. just quietly push to the finish now. All I can say is that pivot party has turned into pivot mania. I heard that phrase from Bank of America. It seems like we're whipsawing into the end, Damian. Yeah, that divergence between the Fed and the ECB over the this past week is nothing short of spectacular for risk assets, EM included, but it's not quite over for EM just yet. We have a lot of central bank meetings next Hi. week, Hungary, Indonesia. We even have Japan next week as well. Yeah, I actually saw some rate cuts over in Peru, and I thought, man, he's gonna be, you're going to be really he's excited today. You're going to go crazy <laughs> and cover that for us. I will just say the outperformance this week of uh, some of the less loved areas really was what stood out to me. I was just calculating. The uh, week-to-date moves include a 2% uh, gain on the NASDAQ about a 2% gain on the S&P, but Katie, 9% gain on the KBW index of banks, 6.2% uh, gain for the Russell 2000. This is a true broadening out. It took until, what, the last month and a half of the year, the year but we're finally get that, getting that broadening out. And it's not just at the sector level. I mean, also small caps have been doing really well. It's not just these huge, heavy companies at the top of the deck uh, that are outperforming. Now it's also those smaller companies as well. Even as you still have some people warning that, you know, the cost of capital is really high right now, that's maybe not the best news for these smaller, weaker balance sheets. Do you buy that, Damien, that this is sort of a head fake? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. A lot of people are talking about fading this move, but then you have Jeff Gunlock from Double Line out there saying, no, 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 we're going to see low 3% yields in the U.S. 10-year. I mean, we're not there yet. And but who's on the other side of that? Well, and it's uh, none other than Bill Gross. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Well, you know, I mean, look, but at the end of the day, you've got... You've got Mike Faroli at J.P. Morgan also kind of scaling back, saying, wow, maybe we are going to see a few more rate cuts than we initially expected in the next year. Maybe we do need to front load a bit of those. But nevertheless, the verdict is still out as to what's going to actually happen. There. What I found interesting was that you saw real dollar weakness in the past week. And this seemed to be this idea that, you know, people had been expecting the Fed to hold out and be behind the ECB, to be behind the others. It was anything but, Damien, as you were mentioning. Yeah. And now the question is, can we continue to see dollar underperformance if the U.S economy is actually doing the best, right? Sort of how far can that dollar weakness go in light of true economic weakness, the likes of Europe and elsewhere? Well, that's the real question. And a lot of that has to do with China, right? I mean, the euro goes as goes China growth, right? So in, from my opinion, you're going to be looking at China, but the data out of China is so um, opaque and it's so difficult to get your finger on it this year. And I think that's really going to be, you know, what a lot of traders are looking at as we come into Q1. And all I can say, Katie, is that yes, the week is over, the year is over. <laughs> But next week, we get the Bank of Japan decision. We do get the Bank of Japan. Uh, we talk about divergence among the Fed, the ECB, the BOE, and then you have the Bank of Japan just in their own league. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, some of the commentary coming out of Japan. Also, we do have PC, as you reminded me before the show started. You know, there, there is some stuff happening. There is a reason to be here. I will be here. We will be here. So, uh, you know, the year is not yet over. Taking a look at where we are in the morning, uh, we definitely see that pivot party turning into pivot mania in terms of continuing some of the moves, albeit a little bit more tepidly. S&P futures are climbing to all-time highs on the total return basis. But really, people are gaming out now 5,000 on the S&P by year end, up almost a quarter of a percent to 47.84. Kind of shocking, considering that's year-end targets for so many banks. You're seeing a little bit of a dollar strength retracing some of the weakness from the rest of the week as people are wondering whether or not good news is actually bad news or actually just good news for the dollar and for the U.S. economy. Ten-year yields continue their descent, 3.9166. Just think that they started the week 
above 4.2 percent is sort of shocking. Crude uh, a little bit elevated today. Not a lot of drama, but just uh, to take you through some of the data points uh, in terms of economic data. Empire Manufacturing comes out at 8:30 a.m. It's the first read really on uh, December manufacturing. S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMIs come out at 9:45 a.m. We can see that that economic surprise index in the U.S. has been inflecting upward. Again, this idea that a strong economy doesn't necessarily mean that inflation is going to restart, Damien, which is sort of this counterintuitive moment that we have this week. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, the economic surprise index, all notwithstanding, is nothing new, right? I mean, this um, geopolitical risk premium that people are trying to bake into asset valuations, I mean, after the war, Israel, Hamas, all that stuff, it really hasn't had much of an impact. I mean, so, you know, I think from an investment standpoint, you really got to look past that. Well, one thing that has has an impact is the deficit in the U.S. Now, come to the 4, 11 a.m. We get from the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO's current view of the economy from 2023 to 2025, including updated projections. Katie, are we going to start to talk about the deficit again? All of a sudden, people seem to have forgotten about that and just piled into long-term debt, and no one seems to be talking about that anymore. Yeah, it's amazing because that was the real hot topic uh, over the summer and really leading into mid-October when you finally saw that peak above 5% for the 10-year yield. It's definitely fallen out of the conversation. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see how those 11 a.m. numbers are digested. And if that potentially could be a new narrative to end the year. At 4 p.m., we also get total net tre in Treasury international capital flows to get a sense of just how many international buyers really are coming into the market. Is the year over? Joining us to give us a sense <laughs> of whether we can all go home and expect a quiet couple of weeks or whether we can expect another narrative shift. Sophie Lund Yates, lead equity analyst at Hargreaves Lansdowne. I want to just start there. Are you basically packing it up, rewriting your outlook for next year and saying we've gotten a pivot and we're going to lean in. Hi, good morning. Great to be great to be back. Um, really, this is quite a tricky one because you know, we are very much of the opinion that these pauses that we're seeing, it's not a pivot. We are not there yet. And the, the problem is that as much as I don't see, I'm going to jinx it now, but as much as I don't see any major upsets for the rest of this calendar year, as we head into, you know, we always have to be looking forward as we head into Q1. Um, and, you know, slightly later on next year, I do think this market is behaving in a way um, that thinks that rate cuts are absolutely imminent and that we're going to have this Goldilocks scenario. And, and I, I don't currently see that. And I think that there could be um, quite a, a divergence here between what interest rates and the trajectory there actually is and, and what markets are expecting. Um, so I don't, don't want to be a downer here, um, but I, I, I do have, have some concerns around that. Sophie, the Nasdaq's at an all-time high. The S&P isn't that far off. I know you're calling for a little bit of a shift from growth to sort of not value, but quality. I wonder if you could, you know, expand on that a little bit. When you say quality, are you talking about income generation? What, I mean, what do you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, what, what we can say for sure is that there is just so much uncertainty still. And that divergence between what banks are going to do, central banks are going to do, and what the markets are expecting means that, you know, we think that investors should be really trying to place a little bit more quality into their portfolio. And by that, I'm talking about your more old fashioned names, potentially, you know, names with really big brand moats where they've got a bit more reliability over revenue. And um, this obviously spans a lot of um, different sectors. You know, there's a, a big consumer conglomerates that, that account into this. You've got aerospace and defense that have got order books. They know what's coming down the pipes. Um, but then also within that, um, there are really a lot of reasons to be focusing on income as well. Um, and particularly, you know, shout out here, uh, the, the UK has some really quite compelling options there. So that's maybe slightly away from the quality pure play. And I'm talking about there's some really unloved names here in the UK that still have pretty low payout ratios, which makes them more resilient when it comes to paying dividends. And I think that they could also be worth a little bit of attention. Well, Sophie, before we get to the rest of the world, I want to talk about how big tech fits into that quality narrative, because you talk about brand names. I mean, I think about Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera, that have just amazing cash flow. How do they fit into that? Sure. So I definitely think that they they do hold hold a place. You know, I'm certainly not saying that we need to forget tech and, and AI more, more generally. Um, but we know that picking the, you know, the next big technological game changer um, is an incredibly difficult thing to, to do. So when you're looking at this, particularly through the lens of AI and what the, 
what the winners are going to be next year. And um, we absolutely think that it makes sense. Um, and the best way to gain exposure to that is to do so through companies like you've just mentioned, where actually their core businesses are incredibly um, cash generative. Um, demand is relatively reliable. It's certainly not guaranteed, but it's a lot steadier than, than, than others out there. So I do think that tech definitely still has, has a place, um, but we need to be careful that that people aren't overweighting towards towards that area. You know, the US more broadly is looking relatively close to, to fair value. Um, so definitely have a nod to it, um, but it's not the be all and end all and still focus on companies that have um, extra pillars um, to support them as well in, in, in the coming months. Well, on AI, that's a really interesting point uh, that it's really hard to identify the game changers at this point. It sounds like you're saying to not necessarily go all in on those AI pure plays. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the experts get this wrong and it's really, really difficult to, to call um, with, with things that are so fundamentally huge. I don't even think mega trend is the right, is the right word for this. So certainly don't ignore it. That wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't be a, a good thing to do. But absolutely focus on those companies that have the, the deep pockets to throw at this. You know, Apple has it, Alphabet certainly does, as does Amazon, Microsoft. Um, but they've also got good underlying businesses. So rather than looking at the the kind of the more the startup y angle from this or those with, with less of a proven track record, maybe have a look at, at companies that offer you a little bit of diversification within that AI play and then you get the best of both worlds. There's a sense, Sophie, that you like outside of the US more than you like the US simply because they're discounted shares and yet we are seeing the economic data diverge quite considerably uh, in terms of just the flash PMIs that we got out of Europe earlier this morning. How do you justify the idea that that there's more room to run in some of the European equities at a time where we still have a somewhat semi, maybe lacking conviction, but hawkish ECB chair ahead, and you're also dealing with souring economic data. Sure, it's definitely um, incredibly, um, incredibly tough, um, and there are definitely pockets, particularly within the UK and the and the um, wider EU, that you know we wouldn't be be getting particularly excited about say um the difference really is that particularly in in the uk there are some situations where things have been pretty harshly um oversold in in, in my opinion and there is great income potential there that is potentially being being ignored um that, that said um, the U.S. definitely has a great deal of incredible companies. And as you're saying, the, the resilience of the economy has been absolutely phenomenal. And that couldn't and shouldn't be f forgotten. But what I would say is this idea of um, a soft landing or a zero recession is also not guaranteed yet. You know, particularly for me, data points that I look at, you look at the, the, the rates of increase in interest payments on personal items. So everybody's very focused on mortgages. Um, but you look at personal items. That is a really quite scary gradient. And I don't think that this, um, that kind of idea of consumer weakening um, and economic act activity slowdown is necessarily um, being fully, fully priced in. Sophie Lund-Yates, thank you so much for being with us. Sophie Lund-Yates of Hargreaves at Lansdowne, joining us as we parse through the rubble that has been the past couple of days, honestly. Uh, what a tremendous reset, given the fact, Damien, that so many people were expecting the ECB to cut rates before the Federal Reserve starting early next week. Yeah, I mean, look, dollar weakness has been a feature of this move, right? And how long that can continue, how much runway is there as we head into 2024, it really remains the key question, certainly for me as an emerging market strategist. But, you know, it's interesting, what's the impact on equity earnings from that? You know, she mentioned, Sophie mentioned UK equities, which are, you know, the valuation discount, but I'm just, I'm not convinced there. I think it's largely a currency story, and we'll see just again how much runway there is for dollar weakness. Which really goes to your point, Katie, which is essentially the earnings have been really solid in the U.S. Mm -hmm. When you look at tech, that's been an unbelievable driver. It must be exhausting for fund managers to get that question. It's like we don't want it because it's so overvalued, and yet it's not overvalued when you look at the cash flow. Especially when they're trying to pitch the rest of the world. They're trying to pitch European equities. The bare fact of the matter is that Europe doesn't have the American tech companies, and unless you get a really sustained broadening out of this rally, uh, it's a hard Sell. Which is the reason why we keep seeing the U.S. outperform this morning. You are continuing to see it outperform just a touch when you take a look at the dollar, re re uh, regaining some of the ground that it's lost pretty aggressively over the past week. The euro, 109.65, just a harpy to go. It was 107, and then 106, and then 105. And people are talking parity, not so much anymore. Ten-year yields, 3.91%.
What needs to happen to end the war today is the conditions I just laid out. And there's three of them, and they're not that difficult. Lay down your arms, turn over those who are responsible for the October 7th attacks, and give up all the hostages. Three simple things, and this thing can be over, can be over today. That was National Security Council spokesman John Kirby outlining the three conditions for Hamas in order to end the war. This as there is a real shift in tone with respect to the U.S. administration uh, really cautioning Israel to take more of a surgical approach and uh, start to shift away from some of the airstrikes. We've been talking so much about the Israel-Hamas war that we have lost focus of another war that's been raging, which is Ukraine. And we've been focused all week uh, with respect to whether they can get aid from the U.S., but also from the European Union. Uh, let's get straight to it. This is a really important conversation. John Lieber, Managing Director at the Eurasia Group and former policy advisor to Senator Mitch McConnell, joining us right now. And I do want to start there, John, considering the fact that it wasn't just the U.S. that failed to pass aid after uh, Vladimir Zelensky came to Washington, D.C., but overnight, the EU as well, also failing to get anything through before the, year of the, uh, before the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, the but a lot of veto points in it, and it makes it hard to get anything done. Uh, but in the U.S., uh, you know, this is less of an urgent issue than it is in the EU, which, of course, also has a lot of veto points because any one country can stop the aid from flowing for now. Ultimately, you know, this is a, high, a much higher stakes issue in Europe than it is for the United States. And probably uh, the Europeans are going to be potentially more reliable partners than the United States is. But it looks right now like the U.S. is set to punt on this issue, perhaps into January of next year, when further funding for Ukraine will be tied up not only in the Congress's ability to negotiate border funds, but also in their ability to avoid a government shutdown. So this is a really messy negotiation right now, and the outlook does not look great for the continued uh, uh, major flow of weapons and support that we've seen to Ukraine so far. Well, John, that's what I wanted to talk about, the point that you made that this is uh, a higher priority, a bigger issue with more urgency when it comes to the EU. You take a look at what's happening in the U.S. Congress, uh, that debate between more U.S. aid for Ukraine, whereas the Republicans pushing for uh, more border security. Uh, who do you think, what does the compromise look like there, and how does this evolve in January? I think the Republicans have the upper hand in the debate right now because they have the ability to veto any additional aid because Speaker Mike Johnson can just say, uh, thanks for your effort to the Senate. I'm not putting your bill on the floor unless I like it. There's almost certainly enough votes in both the House and the Senate to pass more Ukraine aid plus more border funds. Uh, the Republicans are, are using this as a leverage point to hold out for everything they want on the southern border, changing the asylum rules, uh, creating more ability for the government to deport uh, illegal immigrants. And the Democrats are saying, no, we don't, we're not going to do that. They, they think this is inhumane and they don't want to treat uh, migrants on the southern border that way. And they're at an impasse. So I think ultimately the compromise is going to be something like what Biden proposed, which is a, you know, uh, tens, tens of billions of dollars in additional aid for Ukraine, but the whole th uh, ain't plus the border, but the whole thing could fall apart because the two sides just are not close to agreeing on this border issue, which right now is the linchpin towards getting a deal. John, I'd like to shift back to Europe here. I'd like to talk about Hungary. I'd like to talk about Viktor Orban, the Fidesz party. I mean, what is going on there? I mean, does Viktor Orban represent the belief of the Hungarian people? I mean, they are holding up the 50 billion odd in funds to Ukraine at this point. They're the only EU member doing that. What comes next? Yeah, they're holding up the money, but oddly, they did let uh, they walked out of the room when it came to the, the Ukraine ascension talks. So it, it seems like they're playing what kind of game he's playing is, is really unclear right now. Uh, obviously, Orban's trying to flex some muscle inside the EU and make sure that Hungary's influence is felt. And they're going to revisit this next year as well. I think that for both of these uh, bodies, this debate is far from over. And there's still some more negotiating and horse trading that can happen both within the EU and the United States. But it's, it's hard to say exactly why Orban's uh, doing things this way. It looks like he's just trying to increase some leverage uh, over over the EU for Hungary. Well, John, Hungary is generally viewed as, you know, the closest ally to China within the EU. I wonder, can we read anything into that? Is China, you know, kind of pulling the strings behind the scenes? A little difficult to say, um, especially at this point. I think the outcome yesterday was a little unexpected, particularly on the fact they let the Ukraine ascension go forward. I think that's a sign, you know, that's a long-term process. 
It is going to take many years, probably, for Ukraine to uh, qualify for EU membership. Uh, and it's it's really difficult to say what China benefits from their the EU not funding this war. I think what China wants is probably an end to the war as quickly as possible, uh, but not necessarily on Russia's terms, which is where all of this is going to end up if uh, the U Ukraine can't get more aid out of its Western partners. Just to sort of uh, put a bow tie on that, are you basically saying uh, that Russia will win? if Ukraine doesn't get more aid? If Ukraine doesn't get more aid, Russia has the upper hand. They've got the manufacturing capabilities and the patience in long-term time frame to wear down the West. So Ukraine really needs the West to step up here. And if they don't, they will win this war. In the meantime, we also are dealing with the uh, Hamas-Israel war that keeps going on. But there seems to be a real tone shift from this administration, really warning Israel against more kind of indiscriminate attack, uh, airstrikes or uh, more broad-based military action and more sort of surgical types of procedures going forward. How big of a deal do you think this is? Yeah, I think as the kind of horrors of what happened on October 7th fade in the public's imagination, the political liability for Biden of the Israeli response in Gaza is growing. And Biden, you know, there's a lot of damage that's already been done for him domestically among the progressive left and young voters, which are both important parts of his coalition. And I think that the humanitarian situation in Gaza is becoming untenable for the United, for the United States to support. Now, of course, Biden's only shifting his tone. The U.S. is still supporting Israeli militarily and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. There is a broad consensus among in the United States Congress that Israel has a right to defend itself and it will continue to do so with U.S. support. But for Biden, this is becoming a political liability. And I think that they're going to start putting more and more pressure on Israel uh, privately and publicly to be more tactical in what they want to do and how they approach this. But that doesn't mean that Israel is going to stop, and it doesn't mean that the U.S. is going to stop supporting them. It just what the U.S. wants to see is a hasten, uh, hastening to the next stage of this war, where uh, you know uh, uh, Hamas is, is is removed, and then you can move to a kind of post-war period and uh, and rebuilding. Well, John, to your point on political pressure, we're talking about how the Biden administration is handling this. But let's talk about Joe Biden, the presidential candidate, of course, we're, what, 11 odd months out from the presidential election. You think about these hot wars happening in other parts of the world. How is the American voting public ranking that when they're heading to the polls? I think the wars are bad for Biden because it gives this narrative to Trump that the world is on fire. And Trump, you know, ignoring COVID can, is going to say, when I was president, we had peace, we had prosperity, we had growing real incomes, there was no inflation, and you didn't have all these wars around the globe that are he's going to attribute to President Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan. So as a political matter, the wars uh, are going to play in a pretty major way in the narrative of the U.S. election next year, even though foreign policy is typically not a top issue for American voters. And I think that very much works to Trump's benefit. There's nothing Biden can do about it. He is committed to funding Ukraine if he can, if he can get the money, and he's committed to defend, allowing Israel to defend itself. So this isn't Biden's choice, but it's going to be a problem for him next year if these wars are both still raging in the middle of the U.S. campaign. John Lieber, thank you so much for being with us of Eurasia. We appreciate the insights, especially at a time of uh, growing concern around both of these conflicts. I will just say, Katie, you were mentioning the election season coming 12 months away. It doesn't feel like we're less than 12 months away from an election. I know. Time is passing incredibly quickly, and uh, we really are expecting that to pick up in January. We know that the Trump camp is planning a big push, especially when it comes to Iowa. So uh, a lot more of that. Do markets care, Damien? Well, I mean, they haven't recently, if you look at the price action. Uh, but I mean, look, I think, yeah, certainly what I, I just ha I'd love to have gotten John back on here because the fact that he's saying that the wars are bad for the Biden campaign, I'm not so sure about that. Sometimes mm. war can actually be a good thing in an election year. Go figure. If it if, if you have both parties coming together and believing that, for example, um, you know, you should be in support of Israel or in support of Hamas one way or the other. Um, yeah, it can sometimes be a good thing. The problem is, of course, right now, there's so much internecine disagreement for the Democratic Party in particular. And so how do you then get a coalition within, the party. within your party if there is so much disagreement? Uh, we'll be talking about that going forward. We're also going to be talking about China. We did get data overnight. A bit of mixed uh, kind of signals in terms of the economy over there. I'm so pleased to say Bill Lee, chief economist at the Milken Institute, will be joining us to break it down, what the chances are of some sort of stimulus as we do see the pivot party turning into pivot mania here in the United States.
What a week, an incredible a week of rallies, both in bonds and stocks, as people embrace the idea of a pivot. The party turns to a rager as people get an endorsement, essentially, from Fed Chair Powell. S&P futures up a quarter of a percent, building on some of the gains for this week that are more than 2%, similar type of gains for the NASDAQ 100. Uh, although, interestingly, I will just say this. It really has lagged behind some of the other areas. Joining me today, I am so pleased to say Katie de Greifeld and Damian Sassauer, Tom and John off. Uh, Katie, but to me, that's really what got my attention, the fact that you're seeing a 9% gain in regional stocks at mm -hmm. a time or only a 2% gain when it comes to the S&P. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be quite enough uh, momentum, quite enough time to switch up the leaderboard for the year overall. But this real broadening out has been really remarkable in a year that has just been dominated by big tech stocks. You take a look at the sector level, a uh, complete reversal of the last couple of years. Yeah, it's been a value catch up, right? And we see that, I mean, again, in currencies and rates, we see that with the euro uh, rallying versus the dollar. It's really been a value catch up. And I don't think that's uh, that's anything unexpected given where we are in the in the cycle. And where we are in the bond space. If you take a look at bonds, that's basically what's been driving the entirety of the action. You could see yields plunging by some 20, 30 basis points on the week. A one percentage point decline, more than a one percentage point decline in about a month for 10-year yields. I really am trying to wrap my head around that 3.91 uh, percent the two-year yield at 4.38 percent I mean to me Damien this this is just sort of shocking the idea that we could have a complete reversal and all of the narratives whether it's the deficit whether it's whether some of the international buyers would come back in auctions auctions crowding out nobody cares and nobody can well actually I, I do care you know you and I are probably two of the only people who do care about auctions but interestingly <laughs> enough that 30 year was better than expected you know so I mean look you have to get a gauge for sentiment I think you know primary markets are the best way to do it and I mean if there's demand for treasury at these levels, my goodness, you know, feed the ducks while they're quacking. I will say no one cares about treasury auctions until they really do. Yes. When you have just a blowout, bad sale, then suddenly everyone's an expert. Right. Everyone knows the bidding metrics. Yes. Which seems to be pretty much every economic data point as well. We're also watching uh, the euro and how much it's been flipping and flopping this week. It has been flipping to the upside for most of the week today to the downside as people look at somewhat uh, maybe weaker than expected data in the euro region, offsetting a hawkish tone from the ECB be even with the pivot that we've gotten from the Fed. Under surveillance this morning, General Motors cutting 1,300 jobs at two plants in Michigan. Layoffs at one of the plants is tied to the end of the Chevy Bolt EV, which will no longer be produced in 2024. Mm -hmm. General Motors also slashing 24% of jobs at its Cruise robotaxi unit. Cruise coming under scrutiny from regulators after a driverless car hit a pedestrian in San Francisco in October, causing life-threatening injuries you're sounding sad. Are you sad about the uh, <laughs> loss of self-driving vehicles? Or I'm sad about the three quarters of a billion dollars that GM paid for Cruise just last quarter alone, and now they're laying off 900 people. But I mean, look, you know, you've got to take you know autonomous driving for what it's worth. You know, they're going to be accidents. We're still in the early days, but I think Mary Barra was expecting something on the order of a billion in revenue to come from Cruise in 2025. I don't think we're going to get there soon enough. I don't think so. Well, to me, I'm just struck by the fact that we're looking at a company that has a lot of secular issues facing it. The transition to electric vehicles, the increase in costs from the UAW yeah. contract, the competition from abroad. How much can we talk about these job cuts as indicative, Katie? of a broader kind of retracement from corporate America? It's a great question. I think the auto industry is going to be uh, a fascinating story to watch in 2024 as it really deals with some of those issues. Of course, uh, the big talk of the town over the past few months is where is the demand for EVs? Did we just grossly overestimate it? You think about range anxiety, the cost that you mentioned, and uh, I don't know if we're going to meet some of these lofty targets. Meanwhile, that definitely is a pressure in Europe. Recession odds growing there after a week or the next expected PMI data. Euro area PMI is contracting for a seventh straight month, coming in below estimates for December. Separate PMI data for France and Germany also showing the downturn worsened in the area's two biggest economies. Trader, traders adding to bets on ECB rate cuts for next year after the bank held rates steady yesterday. Two things here. First, the actual economy, and second, the fact that nobody believes Christine Lagarde and her hawkish tone yesterday. <laughs> I want to start with the economy, Damien. How much can you really see that recession developing in a more significant way? especially in light 
of a, a lack of a bone kind of thrown to markets from Lagarde. Very much so. Very much so. And a lot of it coming from China, right? I mean, so, you know, let's be clear. You know, I mean, I do believe that the consensus is that Europe will indeed go into a recession, whether it's shallow or extreme, remains to be seen. But, I mean, just look at the price action off the back of the PMI data overnight. I mean, Euro dollar sold off after almost touching 110. I mean, literally touching 110. And now you've got buns rallying pretty aggressively. So now it's kind of, you know, a little bit more of what we've seen here in the U.S. over the better part of the last week. And, you know, yeah, I think there's room for rates to come down here in Europe. Which is the reason why I think a lot of people are definitely uh, for the U.S., regardless of the underpricing mm -hmm. that they're seeing elsewhere. Exactly. I mean, you think about uh, all the haven aspects that's in the dollar that are in the Treasury market, and uh, it's pretty hard to deny. Meanwhile, talking about China, Treasury Secretary Jenny Yellen planning yet another trip to China for next year. Speaking at a U.S.-China Business Council meeting last night, Yellen says she expects to focus on, quote, difficult areas of concern with my counterpart and restated national security as the top priority. We will seek to cooperate with China on global challenges. And because our national security must remain our foremost priority, we will deploy our economic tools when needed to secure our country's national security interests and protect human rights. One of the biggest wild cards for next year is really going to be China and the U.S. relationship therein. Katie, there's been accusation that U.S. companies have been dictating foreign policy more than the government. Is Are we getting a sense that the government is kind of moving toward companies or the other way around? It's a great question. It's one of the big issues that Janet Yellen is trying to dance around. It's interesting to watch her emerge as one of the key architects in bringing these two countries back together, really establishing this relationship, even though there are some huge huge, huge issues that remain, especially when it comes to the semiconductor industry. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I mean, Moody's put a negative outlook on China just uh, a few weeks back, but I think, you know, what we've seen overnight, we saw some data come in, we saw fixed asset investment come in a little bit better than expected. China's going to be pumping in over $100 billion into year end just to kind of keep the pipes moving, keep liquidity there in, in, in the near term. But I think what's really interesting is the fix last night was as strong as we've seen in some time. That means China's, you know, a proponent of seeing the yuan go higher from here, appreciate relative to the dollar. That can be a good thing for growth in the economy. Which raises this question, how much are they actually going to do, right? Yeah. And this is really the ultimate question for next year that people say, not just with respect to China, but also with respect to the global economy and European markets in particular. Bill Lee knows about this very well, and we're so pleased to get him uh, to weigh in on this. He's chief economist at the Milken Institute with years of experience watching Chinese markets and understanding the psychology behind them. Bill, what do you make of that? Do you think that the uh, what we've seen so far with respect to stimulus is just the tip of the iceberg from the PBS? Oh, China is suffering from the, the four Ds, right? Lack of demand, uh, the de-risking that the U.S. And, and, and China are involved in, bad demographics, and heavy debt. So they really have a lot to, of headwinds to deal with. And right now, the, the management of the economy, the Central Economic Work Conference that just took place, uh, they're pulling out the old solutions, which is we're going to bolster the supply side. We're going to try to make our industries modern. We try to shift our, our resources to try to bolster the supply side of the manufacturing sector. That is the, not the solution that they need to, su to support the economy because the real problem, at least in the short run, is deficient demand. There's no one willing to consume. And I think the Fiscal policy on the part of the Chinese is one where they just have an aversion toward putting support into the household, and into the private sector. And instead, they want to shift uh, emphasis onto the public sector. And that's one of the China's key problems. Bill, as U.S. election season ramps up, you know, we've basically, many are expecting China-U.S. trade rhetoric to kind of pick up again. You know, I mean, obviously, it's one of those few topics that both parties agree upon. You know, do you see this as a risk? Do you see, you know, markets beginning to price in an increase in uh, U.S. tariffs on China in the coming year? I think one of the things that is going to come out of uh, the election uh, uh, campaign is that everyone will agree that we need to de-risk from China. And, and I think one of the, th the results we already see is a diversion of capital flows away from China to the rest of Asia. And, and unfortunately, the Chinese don't seem to recognize the seriousness of this because President Xi and, has not addressed anything past the, the speech he gave in San Francisco about how China is open and welcomes foreign investors, but they've done nothing to reduce the Espionage Act and all of the measures they put in place to make it difficult for foreign investors to get into China. So, so it, this this heated debate that's going to be uh, amplified by the election is going to make the tensions even worse, and that's why uh, Secretary Yellen is really going ahead of the the uh, the wave of uh, and, and trying to get a charm offensive going on both sides, both from the Chinese and also from our side. 
Bill, when the uh, China-U.S. trade war first started, there was a lot of talk from multinationals about how they can't afford to pull out of China, the insatiable demand that was coming out of China. Yet, fast forward a few years, and here we are, and the cost of doing business in China has gone up considerably. What are multinationals saying? Do they want to continue to do business in China? Well, actually, it's split. Um, the people who are already in China are the ones that are applauding President Xi's speech, and they're saying we are devoted to China. We're going to be staying in China because China is our is our market. But if you ask the real question, where are you putting your marginal dollar? More often than not, you're going to hear, "I need to diversify my supply chains. I need to de-risk. I need to find places that are cheaper for my uh, my my manufacturing." And that's often ASEAN and other parts of Asia. So, so the the the, the policies that China has put in place have really not done themselves well in terms of keeping investors there and attracting more money. Well, let's talk about investors there. You know, you mentioned the multinational perspective, but when you think about confidence on the part of yeah. investors, is it there and how do you restore it? China was thought of as the great market where all I have to do is sell one item of my, well, no, all I do is sell one Coke and I'm going to make a fortune because there are so many people there. I think one of the things that, that people are realizing is that while there's a huge population, it's a population that currently is not willing to spend because they don't have the confidence in their income being secure and they don't have the wealth being secure because of the property market. And right now, without a, a public safety net as one of the supports that China can offer their people, people are just saving a lot of their money. And I think the uh, American investors and Western investors are realizing that it's not a safe market, at least in the near term, until China is able to put in some safety nets that will assure the Chinese consumer that their income is secure and their, their, their wealth is secure. Did Fed Chair Powell kind of give a lifeline to both China and the rest of the world, given the fact that there is a massive shift in tone this week? Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, when I was at the Fed, one of the things that we worried about was whether the transmission of monetary policy was effective or not. And we paid, we looked at the real interest rate. And right now, if you look at the belly of the curve, which you're fond of, of mentioning, uh, the most liquid part of the curve, um, you see that the real rates there adjusted for inflation is somewhere over 2%. That meant that we were drawing in quite a lot of uh, capital from the rest of the world. But Chair Powell, by saying that we're going to be targeting that real rate and reducing it, uh, uh, lowering uh, the, the Fed funds rate, I hope by the same pace as inflation is going down and maybe a little bit faster, that will reduce the real rate differential between us and the rest of the world. And that will stem some of the outflow that's coming out of China. Right now, we've seen some of the biggest two-day declines in uh, real rates that we've seen going back to the height of the pandemic. Right now, five-year uh, real rates, 1.69 percent down wow. from a high in early October of 2.6 percent. I mean, just really shocking moves. Bill, do you think that this is overdone, though, given the fact that we're getting stronger than expected data and that yesterday's retail sales came in stronger? I mean, is it consistent to you to see a strong economy and ongoing disinflation, uh, you know, regardless of the fact that we have a fully employed America? We've always counted on markets overreacting, and this is another example of markets overreacting. And Chair Paul put the rate cuts on the table because he wanted the markets to start to lower these long-term real interest rates. Uh, and, and, and it gives him time to slowly adjust the Fed funds rate, probably wait until spring or summer before actually starting the implementation of the stuff, of, of, the, of the rate cuts. And that way, I think he can smoothly navigate that real rate down. Now, if something goes wrong, he has the option to be able to raise rates to, uh, to offer set any kind of upward blip in, in inflation or, or, or go down even further if the economy actually were to go south. Billy of the Milken Institute, thank you so much for being with us. I've got to say the volatility that we've seen over the past week, over the past year, has been shocking. And you do wonder, Katie, what the consequence is of these sort of whipsaw moves in full faith and credit, the sort of benchmark rate for all other instruments. I know it has been just fascinating to watch really the epicenter of volatility become the bond market. The ballast of your portfolio has been the most uh, volatile part of it. Whether there's a baton switch, maybe that goes back to equities uh, in 2024 as the Fed steps away. I don't know. When I think of volatility, I can't believe you guys are saying there's volatility. There's no volatility. The VIX is now at, at levels that we haven't seen in some time. And the vol premium, because real lights have dropped so much, I mean, now's the time to start buying puts. I think it's time to hedge up your bets. All right. You heard there it here you go. first. Exactly. You, know, you are seeing some volatility when you take a look at the move index. Coming up, Bloomberg's Maria today on the EU Leaders Summit as they parse through some major issues, uh, in particular uh, Ukraine aid, but also the fiscal backdrop amid a rather hawkish ECB right now. A lift to markets as the pivot party turns to pivot glory. This is Bloomberg.
we did not discuss rate cuts at all. No discussion, no debate on this issue. And I think everybody in the room takes the view that between hike and cut, there's a whole plateau, whole beach of hold. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know, solid liquid gas. You don't go from, li from solid to gas without going through the liquid phase. An ECB president, Christine Lagarde, recovering from COVID, speaking yesterday with a scarf and taking a very different tone from the Fed. Welcome back. Tom and John are both off preparing for the holiday season. Katie Greifeld, Damian Sassauer, I'm so pleased to say, uh, joining us today. But that really is what struck me was that ultimately, uh, Damian, she sounded like she had a completely different tone than what we heard from Fed Chair Powell. And no one bought it. No, of course not. Well, I mean, look, you know, f full disclosure, I love that she took the 10-year-old tact of trying to explain the movement from a gas to a liquid to a solid in order to explain. <laughs> I needed a refresher. So I, that mean, I needed that refresher. I think that was helpful. But I mean, look, you know, the fact is, you know, how long can they hold out with the euro now pushing above 110? I, I mean, you know, that's going to make things that much more difficult for them to get out of the economic funk they're in. I think she's probably going to turn the other cheek. But when it comes to sort of the fact that you had, you know, the Fed basically handing uh, markets a gift, uh, and then you had uh, President Lagarde really pushing back and markets just not believing her. I thought there was a really interesting quote uh, in a Bloomberg News article that, for the time being, it's only the words of Jay Powell that carry any weight that coming uh, from RBC Blue Bay Asset Management. And I don't know, it's an interesting perspective that, okay, the ECB, the Bank of England, they can try to go their own way, but really it's the Fed that's anchoring things. Which gives you a sense of why everyone focused on the fact that a couple words were taken out of the statement. The words being that inflation is expected to remain too high for too long. And this alone was enough for people to cling on to and say, they're going to cut. And they're going to cut There's before the, the Fed. There it is, right there. <laughs> Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels is going to let us know if that's the pivot. Maria, is that the pivot? No, and look, it, it was not. And frankly, I was not shocked uh, at all by the tone that she took uh, in the press conference. I think that when you look at the central bank and you know the central bank, how it operates uh, internally, they really want to stretch for as long as they credibly, and I say credibly because there'll be a lot of question marks if we get data for the next few months the way we got today, which obviously points to an economy that is definitely softer, but they really want to stretch for as long as they can. As I say, this theme of higher for longer, higher rates, uh, she did not want to precipitate the top of cuts. They've never wanted uh, to do that. They also say they want to look uh, more into the data when you know the governing council too and the way they operate. Uh, the idea that uh, they feel cutting too soon, being forced, uh, pressured, cornered by markets to do that could undo some of the work uh, that they've done over the past year, which is not just about the monetary policy, but really the many ramifications that has had on the political front, on the social front uh, too across Europe. They worry about that. So I was not shocked. I think the question uh, going forward is how long can she credibly sustain that line? And you also know very well uh, the central bank has been criticized at times for being too perhaps optimistic on the resilience of the European economy and perhaps not being that optimistic about the transmission or the monetary policy, which shows inflation is coming down fast. So it's in that tension that will dictate the tone she takes in the next few meetings. Well, let's talk about that tension a little bit more. And I love this uh, quote from Christine Lagarde saying that uh, basically the ECB, it's not time dependent, it's data dependent. But as you mentioned, I mean, OK, so the ECB, they're not going to lower their guard when it comes to inflation. You look at the data coming out overnight, though, uh, recessionary signals there. At what point do those those growth figures really force Christine Lagarde's hand here? Uh, yes. And if you look at it, and by the way, they always say this, they are data dependent. They do not focus uh, on the Fed. They always say we're not a Fed driven uh, central bank. We respond to our own dynamics. And they genuinely believe whether they're right or not, that inflation dynamics, growth dynamics, even uh, labor dynamics are different uh, across the EU. To me, it was interesting yesterday. However, and I think you really had to look between the lines and really listen to that press conference. But when it comes to the data, she did say it will guide our future decisions. And she talked about the first half of the year. I mean, this is not a story that she wants to present as a Q1 and then we see. She talked about the first half of the year. It will be data rich. That's what she said. And then that point, it will get a bigger picture, a fuller picture of where the European economy is going. Having said that, when you get data points like the one that you had uh, today with those PMIs, which are obviously softer, you continue to get maybe uh, better than expected inflation uh, prints. And that is going to put the central bank again in a position where they'll be criticized as to whether or not they're just misreading entirely the, the economy and the prospects for it. 
Well, Maria, let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about, of course, the EU summit that's happening right now. The vote we got uh, yesterday when it came comes to Ukraine aid, Hungary sitting out uh, vetoing that. What is going on with Hungary? What will make Hungary budge here? Uh, yeah, but on that, I would say we have to be a little bit more nuanced because, in fact, you could argue uh, Viktor Orban, he vetoed this uh, part of the deal, but he did not veto uh, the accession talks for Ukraine to one day enter the European Union. This accession process now sets the wheels in motion for one day Ukraine to join the EU, and that was politically very significant uh, for the country, and there was an agreement on that, not because uh, Orban voted in favor, but because he exited the room. I'm told at one point uh, the German Chancellor told him, if you don't agree we get it we understand but we want to have a vote do it unanimously the best way to go about this is just exit leave and he left that room and that's why this deal went ahead when it comes to the money uh, however we knew this was going to be complex we know the 50 billion package that is a pledge that the eu has made over a four-year period that was not agreed yesterday victor orban said he could not agree with the structure having said that i am being told by sources today the european leaders do believe that come january so after the christmas break they will have another meeting in brussels and they can get this through the finish line they also say the situation funding ukraine does have the money to bridge this gap until they meet again in January. Of course, when you speak to Ukrainians, what they say is that they take a rather different note. When you're in a war, you want the money and the weapons as soon as you can. Maria, I wonder if you speak to Hungarians, because after 13 years in office, I mean, many argue that Viktor Orban and Hungary are really a kleptocracy, you know, where the monies are being funneled mm -hmm. to family and friends. I wonder, do you believe this? More importantly, do the Hungarian people adhere to Viktor Orban's belief that aid to Ukraine should be restricted? It's a very complex uh, situation because, uh, again, it's undeniable that Viktor Orban has won, uh, the elections has won numerous times, and obviously he is the Prime Minister of Hungary, so when he comes to Brussels, he does speak to some extent uh, with the voice of the Hungarian people. When you talk to the Hungarians, however, there are many differences and many different opinions about what to do with uh, Ukraine. We should also note that for all the optics, the theatrics, and even the testosterone that Viktor Orban carries, I mean, when you're in a news or, or in a new room, a room with him, you really feel it. But nonetheless, yesterday he was isolated on a number of topics. Uh, when it comes to the funding, I think this is also yes. a play that he does to get his own funding and his own money. If you ask me, will there be money for Ukraine come January? I would say it's very, very likely, in fact. So, Maria, I wonder if you could expand on that for our audience. Just let them know, like, why, are, why is the EU holding up funds to Hungary, first of all? And secondly, I guess, you know, can Brussels actually release those funds? Is there any discussion there? Well, the funding, uh, look, how much time do you have? Because this is <laughs> right. uh, a story that goes back uh, years. There has been concerns now, and these are serious concerns, by the way, about the uh, judiciary in uh, Hungary, about the idea of rule of law, but also the separation of power, which uh, the European Union has said at times has been dented by the Orban administration. As you know, there is funding that the EU provides to all countries uh, across the, the euro area in a different amount, of course. Uh, that funding has been blocked for many years. Uh, now, for Hungary, the Hungarian say they are making progress and in fact they amended a piece of legislation uh, two days ago to get the full package they got only a part of it and the inclination would be now that Viktor Orban would push it and continue to push until he gets the amount of money he believes uh, he deserves but it is a complex uh, task for the European Union because on the one hand you don't want to be seen as compromising uh, rule of law and, and the democratic values that the EU says it stands for but at the same time they know they have to cater to the needs of Ukraine so again it is being floated that if there isn't a fully unanimous deal in January from the EU, maybe they could do it at 26. So 26 countries minus Hungary. That is complicated. But as I said this morning, Europeans do say we didn't get this deal. This package is not approved. But Ukraine can still bridge it until January. And there will be a deal come January. Maria Tadeo, always wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. I love that she can just drop in the testosterone that she could feel from Viktor Orban into the conversation <laughs> as she heads into the next uh, meetings. Coming up, we are going to be speaking with Julian Emanuel of Evercore ISI at a time where some people are gaming out the possibility of the S&P hitting 5,000 in the next few weeks. This from Tony Roth, Chief Investment Officer for Wilmington Trust. Katie, 
do you hear this as some sort of sense of, you know, well, we have no idea at this point, given how quickly things have moved? I mean, you have your year end targets, but it's also the path to get there, too, which I find really interesting, especially as we pull forward this rate cut pricing. It's going to be interesting to hear from Julian Emanuel specifically about the path that he sees, because uh, looking at his notes, it looks a little rocky. Well, yeah. illiquid trading conditions also, so anything can happen into year end. I'm not suggesting that that, I mean, that's a huge move, obviously, but, you know, on light volumes, anything can happen. You think everyone's going home. <laughs> everyone's gone home. All right. Except us. Silver. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you're watching from your home, welcome. And coming up, we will have that conversation with Julian Emanuel from a lovely New York. Good morning. I think we are in this new regime. I don't think central banks have a better handle on what's to come next. This is about inflation coming in better and the Fed adjusting as a result. What we learned from the Fed is that we have to start entertaining our bull case a little bit more. I think Jerome Powell is fixated on delivering this soft landing. I've been calling for a softish landing. Now I think I just have more conviction in that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Are we there yet? It feels like the longest year ever, and I'm just talking about the past uh, month. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, Tom and John are off today. I'm so pleased to say that joining me, and perhaps bad for them, really good for us, Katie Greifeld and Davian Sassauer, as we parse through the rubble of a week that just totally shattered, Damian, a lot of expectations. When you said, are we almost there yet, I thought sitting next to me, it would spend a little bit too long. No, I mean, look, <laughs> look there's Never still- Enough, There's Carry still on. plenty of data to digest. And quite frankly, I mean, the way these markets are moving, I don't see how people can take a vacation yet. They can't not be in this market. There are opportunities to make money here. Well, thankfully, it's a little bit calmer this morning. You take a look at uh, futures right now. It's pretty subdued. I mean, we're still looking at gains. That's been the trend uh, in the equity market. The bond market, I think we can call it unchanged. I hope I didn't Unch jinx it. But uh, after just a massive, massive rally, it looks like maybe we're finding uh, a point to settle in on. We've been talking about this for a while, right? We were settling in on a level, you know, north of 4%. Now we're settling in on a level near 3.9%. At a certain point, have we at least found the center of gravity lower to yields with the sense that maybe the sky isn't the limit? as everyone just sort of welcomes in this disinflation that's going to come without a hit to growth. Well, you know, Mira Shandon at J.P. Morgan FX makes a really good point. She says it's the two sides of the dollar smile, right? You've got, you know, U.S. exceptionalism and then, you know, recession, everything goes to hell in a handbasket, dollar will rally in both. But that middle ground, you know, is very, very shallow. You know, the market is just going to bounce back and forth between the two. It's these two bipolar extremes that are really driving market consensus. And so that's why the range is expanding. And that's why we're not really seeing the volatility, but we're seeing the price action move all across the board. We've been talking also about how everyone's going to be rewriting their outlooks for next uh, next <laughs> year. And they wrote them two weeks ago. Now they need to rewrite them. And Kitty, you said something really important just a couple moments ago where you said it's the path of how you get there. That is not necessarily just in terms of getting straight to 5,500 after getting to 5,000 by year end, as some people are now projecting out. How much are people looking for that slowdown to surprise, to be the real surprise that uh, maybe has been taken off the table for now? Well, that's the big question. Of course, it looks like right now we're heading to a soft landing. And the start of the soft landing, uh, it looks like a soft landing, but it can also look like a hard landing. So, uh, I mean, Jerome Powell himself on Wednesday said that they're very aware of the risks of keeping rates too high for too long. Uh, and even if we you know, have to wait until March, you know, that's still higher for quite a significant amount of time. I want the soft landing of a mattress and just sort of falling into it <laughs> over the weekend. Right now in markets, you can see a little bit of a lift uh, after a really uh, incredible rally this week. And it has not been a rally in S&P futures. It has been a rally uh, in what we've seen with the Russell 2000 and the rally in particular, the KBW index up 9% so far this week. Uh, week. S&P futures up about a quarter of a percent. The euro giving back some of its gains throughout the week as people take a look at some of that negative data. 109.69. The 10-year yields, sure, stasis, but still inflected lower. And considering the fact that we started this week above 4.2 percent and we're now at 3.91 percent, that's just a week. This is full faith and credit. Uh, U.S. debt. New York crude uh, also having a bit of a lift. Uh, now north of $71 after people were talking about how low can it go. What we're looking at today 
kind of a slower day today after a pretty wild week. Empire Manufacturing coming out at 8.30. S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing Services and Services PMI is coming out at 9.45. The economic surprises in the U.S. have started to inflect back upward, meaning that they are coming in better than expected more frequently. And Katie, again, this just sort of confirms this idea. We have a stronger than expected economy but that's not taking away from the disinflation narrative. And the question becomes, how do markets read that better than expected data? For so long, good news has been bad news, uh, not to you know trot out tortured phrases, but maybe hmm. good news maybe is just good news now. So good news and soft landing, and let's just uh, have a weekend. 11 a.m., the Congressional Budget Office will publish CBO's current view of the economy from 2023 to 2025, including updated projections. You care about auctions, I care about auctions. I think this is where people are gonna start to parse through. All right, when do we have to care about the deficit, David? Well, the big question for me isn't whether the markets are going to, uh, whether the Fed's going to cut, it's why. What is the reasoning they're going to use when and if they eventually do cut? Is it enough to just say, oh, inflation's back below target, it's time to cut? I mean, if growth is kicking, you know, it's going to be a very difficult, uh, a, a difficult argument to make. And at 4 p.m., certainly it is. There's also the question of foreign investment and total net treasury international capital flows get uh, pointed to, given the fact that there's been a real question about whether they will come back, uh, given that hedging flows, hedging uh, values are a little bit cheaper. Uh, Julian Emanuel of Evercore ISA calling for the S&P 500 to end next year at drumroll 4750, basically where we are now. He sees a pullback in the first half that will take the index down to 3970 and then a rally kicking in, quote, prior to the 2024 election based on perceived recession uh, trough and inflation falling to the Fed's 2% target. Julian, I'm so glad to say, is joining us now. Julian, you're calling for a pretty big drawdown. Does that mean that you're really leaning against what we're seeing right now? Well, actually, in context of, of typical drawdowns, it isn't really that big, you know, on the order of 15, 16%, which you tend to see in most years, you didn't see it in 2023, which is why the, the VIX is at 12. And we had this, you know, incredibly great feeling. And obviously, we've had a lot of momentum in December. And look, the, the message we got from the Fed was very much an all clear. The markets responded in kind. Uh, but frankly, when you think about it and you go back to July, when we had that interim peak, uh, tw at the, the time of the last uh, hike, in fact, of the cycle, there was that diminution of the wall of worry. The wall of worry doesn't exist right now. And so from our point of view, even if you manage to skirt around a recession, which is certainly possible, and the data doesn't show that we're in imminent danger, but even if you do, there is likely going to be a growth scare time just because there's so much optimism in the markets right now. So that's what you think is going to crack it. Bad economic data. That is what you think is going to spur the downside, not any kind of retracement about the idea of a Fed pivot. No, the, uh, the, the Fed is not going to, uh, unless the inflation data surprise to the upside, which again, it doesn't feel that that's going to be the case, though I would observe that notably, uh, you know, oil, among yeah, other things, yeah. have rallied quite strongly the last couple of days, uh, perhaps in response. Uh, but no, it, it, I think that, that based on what we've seen, the Fed is likely going to try and be as quiet as it can for the next several months. Does that mean that it drops out as a driver? Because you think about the equity markets, they've been so macro driven for quite a long time right now. If the Fed really uh, is on hold, maybe starts cutting those rate cuts already priced in, do we start paying more attention to corporate fundamentals? Well, look, the Fed will never disappear in this cycle because the cycle is so unusual. But you know, we'll turn the page to January. We will remember that we will have a government that will be facing shutdown. We will have elections in Taiwan and we will have fourth quarter earnings reporting season. Uh, you know, from our view, it's not that big a deal, but bottoms up consensus is a bit too high in terms of earning ex expectations. Those will be walked back. And then, as has been the case this entire year, the most important thing is not going to be what the news is itself but the price reaction to the news. And if you think about it, all the volatility this entire year has been almost exclusively the, the purview of the bond markets. It's been relatively quiet in terms of credit, 
in terms of equity, we think that's going to change a little bit next year. So, Julian, let's say I agree with you, and I do believe the time now is to get defensive, given where the market is, right? What's the best way to do it? Do I want to be rotating into some of those classic defensive st- sectors like staples, healthcare, et cetera, utilities maybe? Or do I want to be using options? Put your options hat on for me. Do I want to be buying puts? Do I want to be selling calls here? How do I protect? So, so the beauty of what we've had the last number of months is that some of the more classically defensive areas haven't actually uh, you know, been the beneficiary of interest rates coming down and inflation coming down. A lot of uh, other noise, you know, in, in areas like consumer staples and healthcare, there's been a lot of confusion and a lot of fear, frankly, around the GLP-1 phenomenon. Uh, and so people have stayed away from there. But now all of a sudden we're, we're in a place where, particularly when you think about inflation, input costs into those sectors are moderating. Mm-hmm. Wage gains are starting to moderate. They are going to benefit. And frankly, in the work that we've done shows that the defensive sectors, as you said, staples uh, and healthcare, in particular the ones we like, tend to outperform on average from the time of the last Fed hike to the time of the first cut. So it's really a way to play offense with defense. Well, to get to the second part of Damien's question, beyond just buying maybe defensive type sectors, are you looking to hedge here? So it is is something where particularly if, and we say this very much in terms of the retail investor's mindset, is that what you want to do is envision yourself as a buyer down, call it 15 percent, an average type of, of yearly drawdown. And if you don't see yourself as a buyer because buying the dips has been a strategy that's worked our entire investment lifetimes, we don't see that changing, then you want to take advantage of the fact that options are incredibly inexpensive. Are bond yields going to go a lot lower in the scenario that you put out? So, so I think bond yields are sort of maybe getting to some sort of stasis because obviously, look, if we do have uh, an economic turn down or at least a growth scare, clearly that's more downward pressure on yields. But on, on, on the other hand, there's this idea that there's a secular change in international investors' appetite for fixed income and, oh, by the way, the Fed's still doing QT, so that limits uh, any downside in bond yields. Just to give you a victory lap, you did call the turn in small caps. It's been a rip-roaring rally over the past six weeks. Is it time to get out ahead of uh, some concerns about growth? We don't think it is, and, and, and actually it, it, it's fascinating because this has never happened for, before in 2023. You undercut your bear market low uh, in, uh, in small caps just at, at that October low. And then, then less than a month later, you had a new 52-week high in the NASDAQ. That kind of divergence has never been seen before in the entirety of a calendar year, let alone mm-hmm. one month. And so if you think about it, even if you do get a recession, uh, small caps have, for the most part, already been through their recession uh, in terms of share price performance. And again, similar to consumer staples and healthcare, they're going to benefit from a labor market that's easing. And yes, the consumer still does have excess savings, which we think cushions the severity of any downturn. Juliana Emanuel of Evercore ISI, thank you so much. Right now we are seeing in the market a little bit of a lift to basically beyond the year-end target that Julian has of 47.85, up a quarter of a percent. Julian, how much do you think, though, that there is enough fear that could get brought in from any weakness to give a drawdown given that there is so much cash that's going to be pushed out of money market funds as yields go in? Well, it, it, it's definitely going to uh, cushion the blow, but again, Going back to this idea, yes, we've more or less been promised uh, three rate cuts, uh, but in fact, if uh, inflation does not continue that, you know, very, uh, you know, marked at this point uh, downward path, you're still going to have cash yields north of 4 percent, 4.5 percent. And again, within the context of the last 15 years, that's still quite attractive. Julian Emanuel, thank you so much. To me, this really is one of the key questions, Damien, this idea of being pushed out of cash. I know Tom's been really in on this, the idea that suddenly it's not yielding 5% anymore, so it's not going to be the same lure. Crowding out, right? But I mean, what's interesting, and Julian hit the nail on the head with this, is seasonals, right? I mean, like, if you want to talk about, you know, no one wants to talk about seasonals 
until it's happened, right? And you look back at October, and now from November to now, I mean, it's like a it's like a playbook, you know? I mean, just sell. I mean, buy in November and you know, ride it up through January into February, and you know, sell in May and go away. Are we going to talk about the Santa Claus rally at any point? I wonder. No, oh, we're not. Good. Anyway, <laughs> were, were you hoping we that we just were going to? Yeah, we'll I, cool? I. Yeah. Okay. If you want to talk about it, you go for it. Do you want to talk about it? Do you have something to say? Not, not a burning one. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll we'll get that to you. The burning take on the Santa Claus rally and what else we can call it. Coming up in Bloomberg uh, in Washington D.C., Bloomberg's Mario Parker. That's next. What needs to happen to end the war today is the conditions I just laid out. And there's three of them, and they're not that difficult. Lay down your arms, turn over those who are responsible for the October 7th attacks, and give up all the hostages. Three simple things, and this thing can be over, it can be over today. That was John Kirby, National Security Council spokesman, uh, talking as the U.S. administration does shift its tone just a bit with respect to the Israel-Hamas war, really warning Israel against uh, going forward with the same type of airstrikes in terms of the same pace, at least, going forward. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Katie Greifeld, Damian Sassauer here with me today. Uh, and Damian, I've got to say, it's been so uh, sort of distracting and uh, such a, a focus point to keep watching the tit for tat and just wondering, when is it going to be over? Yeah. When can we move on? Well, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, certainly the American war machine is back up and running. The amount of money the U.S. is spending on defense, you know, most since, I think, 2019. But, you know, Biden's $106 billion request, you know, getting not coming through. The EU not coming through with funding for Ukraine. I mean, this creates a lot of uh, just a lot of noise amongst all of the other stuff we're seeing in terms of geopolitics globally. I'm glad that you mentioned the defense bill. It does look like they might be able to get something passed, yeah. which was a surprise. It means that President Biden is going to cater to certain aspects that will anger some of the progressives, but that also Republicans really isolated some of the more fringe members. And I want to go there with Mario Parker, who is in Washington, D.C., is Bloomberg White House and politics team leader in Washington. Mario, what do you make of that, the sort of coming to the middle that you're seeing to get some sort of military aid passed. Yeah, well, you're saying you saw earlier this uh, this week Zelensky came here to Washington, D.C. to put a little bit more pressure, particularly on Republicans as well. You're saying the Democrats, you're saying the Biden administration makes some tough concessions that they had been holding on to. We're looking at we're talking about maybe discussions about immigration reform, border reform, et cetera, in order to get that aid. We know by and large there is support for Israel. But to your point, the point that you all just made, uh, the 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 continue aid to Ukraine without some of the preconditions has been a sticking point. Mario, Trump flipped Michigan in the most recent poll. Now all seven swing states are in favor of Trump, uh, you know, according to our last Bloomberg poll. I mean, talk to us about those poll numbers. You know, what is driving that? Is it Israel Hamas? Is it, you know, geopolitics? Is it domestic economic issues? Or is it something else like, uh, you know, right to choose? I mean, what are your thoughts there? It's a little bit of everything, right? But the, the main thing is the fact that Americans, by and large, feel as though the economy just isn't working for them right now, right? You've got, uh, which is a contrast and a, and a frustration for the Biden administration. We just, we, every week it seems like they're getting some type of positive da economic indicator data coming in, but Americans just feel just very glum about the economy, and they're giving more credit to former President Donald Trump, right? So for the Biden administration, there's this frustration that there's this this amnesia rather uh, uh, about the Trump years, this angst that they were able to stir in 2020. They're just not seeing that right now in the ground in some of these key swing states. Well, Mario, what's going to be interesting in this election year is in addition to actually the issues, we have both the president and Trump basically facing a lot of legal issues themselves. Right. Talk to us a little bit about that timeline. Like what should we be looking out for regarding, you know, Hunter Biden regarding Trump? I mean, what comes next? Well, with Hunter Biden, we saw him in the Capitol earlier this week kind of playing a game of chicken with House Republicans who are trying to make him the focal point of uh, investigations here. Some of that is a, a, re, uh, a reboot of what we saw in 2020, where he, in the final stretch, he was a, a main topic of discussion as well. That pretends to be, I mean, that'll be the case. He'll be front and center over the next year or so with some of his legal troubles. At the same time, for former President Donald Trump, what we're seeing... Uh, uh, even as he's 
seems to be cruising toward the GOP nomination, he does have to ha have several knockout blows in the primaries earlier ne next year. That's talking about Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, right? Because what happens in early March, just around uh, Super Tuesday, and so, so, uh, he's set to have his first court date for uh, some of the election, uh, his, uh, his actions around the 2020 election. Well, in the same way that Donald Trump's legal troubles haven't seemed, seemed to impact his campaign at all, his popularity uh, with his base, what do Hunter Biden's legal troubles mean for the Biden campaign, if at all? Well, the Biden campaign, at least right now, is signaling that they had one of their best fundraising days uh, right after the, uh, the, the the Republicans this week kind of targeted, uh, re-upped their targeting of Hunter Biden. So for them, they're trying to spin this into a positive. They're actually, what's ironic about it is they're taking a, playbook, a, a page out of Donald Trump's playbook, right, where you would see his court appearances or indictments coming in, and then he would say that he's raised X amount of money as well. Um, um, but otherwise, the, the, the White House, what you're going to see is uh, you're not going to I mean, you're going to see you're not going to see Hunter Biden, uh, you know, prominently in display with campaigns or anything like that. They're going to try to com compartmentalize it. They're going to try to say, again, similar to what Donald Trump is saying, that this is politicized. This has nothing to do with the president. Uh, the president had nothing to do with Hunter Biden's troubles and that the voters shouldn't hold that against him at all. And, of course, looking forward to the 2024 presidential election. Uh, Bloomberg News broke the story this week that you take a look at Donald Trump's campaigns. There's plans there to significantly ramp up their activity in Iowa during the first two weeks of January. And as we finally flip the calendar into 2024, how quickly might we expect the GOP field to shrink at this point? Well, we could see it shrink pretty quickly, right? I mean, uh, polls this week showed that Donald Trump has about 51 percent of the vote in Iowa. Nevertheless, and this kind of goes back to just the calendar, the legal troubles, et cetera. Nevertheless, you see him kind of keeping his foot on the gas in a state like Iowa because he needs to sew that up pretty quickly before he's pulled off the campaign trail and more more spending, have to spend more time in the courtroom, right? Well, we could see uh, in this 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 unique election where it looks like we're going to have a rematch of a 2020 election. What we could see is a, the longest general election that we've seen in modern history, right? If he sews up Iowa in early uh, in January, January 15th, if he sews up New Hampshire, if he sews up uh, South Carolina with really resounding wins that, that, that back the polls, then we will see a general election fight where he's pivoting to Joe Biden and Joe Biden's pivoting to him. We're talking about like March and April. April, which is exactly very early. I'm sure what everyone wants to see the longest general election in history with two candidates that no one's particularly excited about <laughs> according to a lot of the elections Mario Parker I'm curious about the possibility of third party candidates we always talk about this it never actually gains any traction is this year different. No, this year is different, right? And it kind of gets at what you just said, right? Uh, Americans really are dissatisfied with the two choices they have before them. And so they're looking to some other arms, right? Not necessarily that a third party candidate will win the White House, but they could very well play spoiler. And a lot of that is because of the dissatisfaction that voters have with both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, right? So you're saying some of these third, this is, if the election is anything other than the rematch between two of these folks. Uh, the other thing is this is the year, this seems to be the election of the third party candidate, right? You're getting a crowded, more crowded field of third party candidates than we've seen in recent years. And then we'll have to look through in terms of who many vote, how many votes they take away from each of the <laughs> candidates. Bloomberg's Mario Parker. Thank you so much. Are you excited for this, Katie? I am kind of excited. I know that uh, you just made the point that these are two candidates no one's excited about. Not uh, by the people. <laughs> not by the people. Uh, but when you think about uh, just all of the geopolitical issues that are in the world right now, you think about domestic voters who tend to be very focused on domestic issues. It's going to be interesting to see the messaging from both campaigns, how they try to tread those lines. Well, I, had, I hate to, chair, uh, to channel Chair Eccles here, but the reality is, you know, this is an election year. So, you know, the fact that the surprise that, you know, Chair Powell was so dovish heading into 2024, a lot of people might be drawing corollaries between the fact that, hey, you know, um, 
cutting rates in an election year is not necessarily something we haven't seen before. Well, a lot of people were talking about that yesterday. Is there a coincidence that he totally shifted gears in two weeks after Correct. Janet Yellen came out and said the same thing two and sort weeks. of speaking from the same hymn book? The issue that I have, and just sort of stepping back from that particular back and forth, which I'm sure we'll be analyzing for a long time, is that we haven't heard President Biden be able to celebrate an economy that mm. actually looks like it's achieving what nobody thought it could. Yep. And this is sort of the perennial frustration that we're seeing increasingly from the administration. Why aren't you giving us a victory lap? And then in the satisfaction polls, you're not seeing it, which raises this question, what's going on? Why are people feeling so bad? You can't just discount people's feelings and say they're not valid. No. Well, I mean, look, it's difficult to t it's difficult to tell what the majority of Americans are even thinking on many of these topics. So I think that, that therein lies the rub. And a lot of it is just in terms of the level of inflation that's been coming up. Coming up next is Earl Davis of BMO Capital Asset Man Global Asset Management on fixed income. Does he still see higher yields from here? Sawing into the end of the year, trying to get a new bearing after a Fed pivot turned into something that looked glorious for the bulls and really problematic for the bears. Right now, we're seeing a lift to markets as we uh, tread into the end of the week, the end of the year. 47.85 on the S&P, up a quarter of a percent after more than 2% gain. The Nasdaq actually uh, regaining a little bit of its steam, up about three-tenths of a percent. Uh, and you're seeing the Russell 2000 again. And Katie, continuing to outperform, up eight-tenths of a percent after already gaining uh, north of, I believe, 5% so far this week. Yeah, as I was saying earlier, I mean, I hadn't looked at the year-to-date chart of the Russell 2000 in a hot minute, and the line has just gone straight up. The out performance of small caps has been really breathtaking when you think about especially what a terrible year they've had up until really mid-October, early November. The well, other thing that's been a straight line up has been the KBW index of banks. You've seen that increase by about 9% just this week. I mean, talking about a week as a month. And Damien, we take a look at the bond yields. Yields have come in, and that has been what's fueled everything. Two-year yields, 10-year yields, 10-year yields going down by more than a percentage point since the uh, middle of October. How are lower yields good for banks? Yeah, Lisa, no, no, you make a great point. I need to refresh and look at how uh, you know equity income yields are comparing, how dividend payout yields are looking relative to fixed income in lieu of the recent move we've just seen. You know, Because we were pretty close at a, for a while there. Obviously, bond yields have become you know, higher the dividend payout yields. But I mean, like, my goodness, it's been such a quick move so fast. It's interesting how equity investors are looking at this. Well, you bring cash into the conversation. I mean, cash has been the biggest competitor for about every asset class uh, going back at least a year. So uh, now that we have the markets really in love and fully bought into the fact, uh, this idea that we're going to get meaningful amounts of Fed cuts, do we finally start to see that 5.86 trillion dollars start to make its way out of money market funds. Yeah, no, I mean, money market funds still have a lot of powder to put to work, but the question is, it's year end. Obviously, I, I, it's really going to be more of a, a question for January as we mm -hmm. kind of look ahead to the new year. I mean, just how many people are going to reach into their pockets or reach out of their money market funds and try to chase. So we'll see. And it also is curious because people are trying to game out can they spread from the U.S. to the rest of the world? Is this a lifeline, mm -hmm. as Bill Lee was saying from the Milken Institute, in terms of uh, what the outlook is for China, what the outlook is for emerging markets, your territory, One way for dollar weakness, as yeah. well as for the euro. What you can see today is a bit of dollar strength. And this to me is interesting because uh, a lot of people are talking about, OK, dollar weakness here to stay with the pivot there, but not the pivot, the ECB or the, or, or the Bank of England. And yet today people thinking, well, maybe the economy matters again. Maybe it does. And it's been interesting to see where uh, that dollar strength is coming against this morning, coming against the euro. The euro was having a pretty good week uh, up until the last few days, especially uh, when you consider the Fed and the ECB. But I don't know, I, this dollar it's feels like we've been calling its death for a long time. A a currency movements this year, year to date, has been a carry story. It's been about yield differentials, right? And since I would say June, we have seen that kind of, you know, kind of fizzle away, right? So now what comes next, right? Do we see the shift toward growth? Do we see the shift toward value? I mean, what's going to be the next driver of currency movement? Because clearly, rate differentials have compressed a bit and are moving in a different direction. And certainly, the euro still has lower yields in the U.S., yet it's rallying versus the dollar on forward expectations. Something interesting here. Let's talk about the European Union. Under surveillance this morning, EU leaders agreeing to open membership talks for Ukraine 
But failing to back a new aid package, setting the debate into early next year, the $54 billion package was backed by 26 of 27 members. There was one nation standing alone, it was Hungary that opposed the funding. And we were talking about Viktor Orban and some of the colorful language that we heard from uh, our colleague over in <laughs> Europe. But I am wondering uh, whether this really does leave Ukraine kind of in limbo heading into a winter, especially, uh, Katie, as Russia really ramps up their financial support. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's Hungary that's the odd man out here, but that, of course, is gumming up uh, this aid from the EU. You think about what's going on in the U.S., unable to pass uh, an aid package there as well, and it's creating a lot of really, really tough questions for Ukraine uh, as we get into 2024 and potentially another year of this war. Well, let's talk about Hungary for a second, because this is kind of my, you know, realm of expertise. Hungary is one of the, fa I mean, inflation in Hungary is the fastest you're going to find in the Eurozone region, right? And the interesting thing about it is a lot of voyeurs, I'm talking fast money investors, go into the front end of Hungary and basically get, take advantage of those high yields. And sometimes they even do it on a currency hedge basis, but this year, not so much because the forint is one of the top performers on the year. But nevertheless, you know, what's to say that those foreign investors that are keeping propping up, you know, the Hungarian fixed income market are going to stay there forever. They're only taking advantage of the yields in the front end. If yields mm -hmm. start to come off, you know, where are they going to go? And if Hungary isn't playing ball with the rest of the EU, what's to keep them invested? I love you. You come out and it's like, it's all about the fixed income market. Victor Orban is going to get disciplined by a fixed income market. We'll discuss. City, meanwhile, uh, to just shift gears a little bit, shutting down its muni business, saying in a memo to staff, quote, it's no longer viable given our commitment to increase the firm's overall returns, the move impacting about 100 employees, according to people familiar with the matter. City hopes to complete the wind down by the end of the first quarter. There are two things here. And Damien, I want to get to you with your intimate experience of oh, working no. at Citigroup. Uh, but Katie, there there is this issue of prioritizing the appearance of backing roads and tunnels and some of the conflicts that have come into play in Texas versus the uh, just sort of getting in the black, getting good profits, which definitely has been Jane Frazier's main focus, and just stripping away businesses that have not been outperforming. Oh, yeah. Jane Frazier has been uh, absolutely ruthless in her uh, path to drive profit. This, this was shocking. Uh, I don't, I'm not quite as intimately uh, acquainted <laughs> with Citigroup, but I did cover Muni's for a hot moment a few years ago. And I mean, Citigroup was so dominant in the muni market. Uh, the fact that they're completely exiting this business, really shocking people in that market, which it's a little sleepy, but we're talking about $4 trillion here. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, quite frankly, there's just a scarcity. There hasn't been all that much issuance. I mean, the reason munis do well is because it's a scarcity play. There's just not a lot of municipals out there. But what you're really drawing men on is my time at 388 Greenwich at Citigroup's headquarters <laughs> downtown in Tribeca, when the muni guys were the ones who had ground floor access. Their entire group was separate from the sixth floor and the seventh floor and the rest of the firm, they had their own little place where they hung out and did their thing and they were awesome, man. Kings. They killed it. They crushed it. They killed it, or is this resentment? A little bit of, a little bit of resentment. <laughs> I mean, come sure. on. They killed it. They were really great, but look, they had grabbed access. I will say this. Didn't. City is Mike Mayo's top pick for 2024, go figure. Yeah. Well, there has been a lot of restructuring, and Jane Frazier has been reviewing everything, and there are no sacred cows, and that was made clear. Meanwhile, this story is one that I know is generating a lot of discussion for a lot of people at their dinner tables, potentially for sons who are Mets fans who feel like it's completely <laughs> unfair that the L.A. Dodgers have such an incredible advantage. Show Hey Otani, wearing his number 17 Dodgers jersey and speaking to journalists for the first time since signing his record contract. Otani talking about the contract, saying, quote, I felt like it was uh, like that was worth it. And I was willing to go uh, that direction. The reigning AL MVP agreeing to a 10 year, $700 million contract. Hold on a second. You might say, oh, yeah, that's worth it, you think. But he'll only be paid $2 million a year for the next 10 seasons with $680 million deferred until the end of the deal. I do just have to say, on behalf of my older son, who was ranting about this, saying that it's completely unfair because suddenly the Dodgers can have an entire budget to go out and get other superstars and create this incredible team without any having any kind of cap because they're only paying $2 million a year. And then it's completely going to undermine the chances of other teams like the Mets of doing anything. Well, that's not entirely true. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because even though it's 10 years, $700 million, that's $70 million a year, $680 million is deferred they are charged $46 million per year against the cap. So they still have to put $46 million, I'm talking the Dodgers here, in escrow each and every year for the life of his contract in order to be able to pay him in 2034 when he eventually starts getting paid. This is really a tax play, Katie. This is really interesting because in 2034, Otani will be 40 years old. He probably will be out of baseball, and he probably won't be living in the, in the state of California. He'll probably be living in a 
tax efficient jurisdiction like, I don't know, maybe Bermuda or the Caymans, where he doesn't have to pay tax on that money. So to me, this is more of a tax play than anything else. This has been a really fun story this week because I went into it thinking I was going to learn a lot about baseball, but actually I just learned a lot about taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so totally true. Yeah. I also learned a lot about the uh, pricing cap and the sales of jerseys that are just off the charts and just what, how big that audience is Talk in Japan. Talk about scarcity and demand. One hundred percent. Let me add one more point that John Arthur has made, which is a very interesting <laughs> point because in Japan we have negative rates going out as far as the eye can see. So from Otani's perspective, as you know, a Japanese, you know, a, a, a Japanese citizen is. What does time value of money even mean with negative interest rates out to infinity, right? Like, I get paid for deferring my money as opposed to having it in hand. It's a very interesting dynamic. Either way, I think it'll be a really interesting season. And I just got a message from someone indicating it's not as if the Mets have no money also. Right. Meanwhile, we are seeing some earnings coming out. Earlier, uh, just this hour, we heard from Darden and the breadsticks at uh, Olive Garden coming out. Basically in line, uh, you are seeing the shares a little bit lower. You are seeing uh, bars and restaurants stay busy this holiday season despite expectations that retail sales would slow food services and drinking places are up 11 percent from november of last year but data from black box intelligence says diners are skipping family meals and fine dining op uh, opting instead for cheaper and faster options i understand this looking at some of the bills that i've gotten michael halen senior restaurant analyst for bloomberg intelligence joining us now with more do you have a sense of just what a downgrade means? Does it mean that basically McDonald's and Olive Garden are doing great at the expense of more bespoke and higher end restaurants? Yeah, I mean, that's what we're seeing this year, um, you know, in, in a slowing consumer environment. And that's what we are seeing with restaurant spending uh, in the second half of this year. It continues to, to slow, um, you know, for a lot of reasons. But uh, a big one is just increased consumer debt. Um, you know, that's how people have been dealing with with uh, higher uh, inflation, right? They've just been opening credit cards, racking up a balance. Um, you know, rates are extremely high. And so so we see a, a consumer that's kind of strapped. Um, we've kind of put it, uh, you know, Darden's kind of, um, you know, they're they're well diversified. They have high end restaurants. They have cheaper places like the Olive Garden and Cheddar's um, kind of what we're we've been um arguing is that you know in a slowdown and in a potential recession what we're going to see is more people going to quick service because you'll have a lot of people saying they they want to save money uh and they can do that moving from full service from a uh one of darden's restaurants to a mcdonald's right you're, you're not paying for the tip uh you're buying you're not buying appetizers um so it's it's a lot cheaper so so we've seen that uh the no november sales data industry sales data that we get from our partner black box intelligence really bore this out we saw over 100 basis points of sequential improvement in the quick service same store sales and uh we saw a similar decline in same store sales at, at casual dining chains we cover and Michael, is this playing out according to script? Is this how it usually goes when you have consumers and diners really worried about inflation and frankly feeling miserable about the economy that they opt for those quick service options? Yeah, kind of the way to think about quick service was like customers fall into that bucket and fall out of that bucket, right? So the low income consumers are probably um, gonna eat at the grocery, eat you know, cook, their, cook themselves, shop the grocery store a little bit more uh, and make their own meals a little bit uh, more frequently. And we've had some of the quick service names that we cover actually talk about that on this latest quarter. Uh, and, but, you know, at the higher end, you'll see more upper middle income consumers and high end consumers actually try to save money by eating at that quick service or a fast casual restaurant more often. Um, kind of, uh, you know, what we've heard is that that a lot of customers uh, U.S. consumers are cutting back at some of their like higher, higher cost, um, independent restaurants and eating at fast food a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, and what we do see in the data is is that fine dining has slowed significantly. It's down, you know, seven straight months I think now. If you are. Um, it, it, if you are just joining the program, yeah, been, the S&P up about a quarter of a percent, but Damien has some pretty strong feelings on fast food, so uh, come on in. No, I do, but usually when Michael and I speak, we talk about, um, you know, Sun's Lacrosse game. Instead, I'm going to talk about Texas Roadhouse, Michael. It carries the highest PE multiple 21 times in full-service restaurant land. What are they doing differently compared to Dart and Cheesecake and the rest? They're growing, and they're growing aggressively, and Wall Street loves growth, Damien. I don't, I don't need to tell you that. So, 
Uh, yeah, they do a ph- phenomenal job, man. I, I, it, there's a lot of value on the plate there. So uh, you get a lot of food for the price that, that they charge. It's, uh, it's an experiential type of place, right, where there's uh, line dancing. Um, it's a very popular place for um, birthday parties and, and, and occasions. So uh, they've done phenomenal, man. So there's a lot of growth, both through same source sales and through net unit growth. Um, it's a very entrepreneurial yeah. culture there, and, and they, they've done a phenomenal job. Michael Halen of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you with the uh, line dancing at Roadhouse Steakhouse. Is that, is that your favorite? I, I like the line dancing. Yeah, no, no, Michael and I like to go line dancing on the weekends. I could see that. Cute. I could see that. It's cute. Thanks. This is Bloomberg. Are we going to get that pullback? Or actually, do you just need to look at the bond market today and say, you know what, 4%, that's not too bad. I still think you do need to be slightly concerned about the supply that's coming. So more intermediate bonds make make a lot more sense, I think, from a kind of risk risk reward standpoint. But we are in an environment which should be should be pretty good for the bond market. That was Ian Steely of JP Morgan Asset Management on a view that pretty much everyone seems to share right now, considering the rally into bonds. Good morning. Welcome back. Damian Sassauer, Katie Greifeld, Lisa Abramowitz, John and Tom, both off today. And we are looking at the pivot party expanding out to all the different asset classes as we try to understand how long this can last. I want to get right to it with our next guest who had a pretty bold call the last time he was on talking about the potential for yields going to 6% on the 10-year. Maybe not that, but he still is a bit counter consensus. Earl Davis, head of fixed income and money markets at BMO Global Asset Management. Earl, do you still see uh, yields going higher from here, even retesting some of the levels uh, that people have basically said are in the background. Yeah, and, uh, and you know what? I'll start with I think 2023 is going to be an extremely informative year for 2024 yields. And what I mean is if you look at the low close on 10 year yields, it's roughly 350. If you look at the high close on 10 year yields, it's roughly 5%. We're of the belief that this kind of volatility is going to continue and we're going to test both the lows, 350, and we think that's a Q1 story and the highs, 5%, and we think that's a Q2 story. Um, a lot of the drivers for higher rates haven't um, haven't uh, left the, the market, right? We still have supply, we still have inflation. I've been in the market since 1994, and I know at any given point in time, the market looks at one thing. <laughs> so now we're looking at the one thing that gets us to 350, and then it'll revert to the other issues that haven't been solved. Earl, you have to you, know, you have to clarify for me. If we're going to see that type of volatility, that type of movement in U.S. Treasury yields, what does that mean for the plumbing of financial markets? Talk to me about the reserve repo facility, the general account. Like, what comes next? I mean, how is that going to manage through? Well, the plumbing is fine. And, and remember, I said the, the volatility that we expect for 2024 is the same volatility we, we had in 2023. Yes, the Fed brought in some additional facilities, but now that uh, the plumbing, the, the foundation is, is solid. And this is an interesting thing. We've been tracking volatility in 2022, and we track it in a simple manner. What's the absolute yield move? So bonds are up one base points today, two down two tomorrow. That's three. 2022 was the most volatile year in the 2000s. Except for, you know what, 2023 is <laughs> not going to be the most volatile year, right. an absolute yield move. So there's no reason for that to stop. There's such a dispersion of views out there, incredible views, plausible views, that, you know, it's a tug of war uh, between these. So we think we'll continue to see that. The plumbing is fine um, and, and we'll be good. And what about demand? I mean, do you um, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the market's ability to absorb all the supply that's expected to come through to, during the first half of next year? Well, you know what? That's why we expect us to go back up to 5%. Uh, the market ability, here's an interesting stat for you. Since 2007, the amount of treasuries outstanding has increased five-fold, five times. The amount of capital at dealers to support that has inventory it. make markets has increased two-fold. So what that tells you is you get broader, wider moves for any given piece of data that comes out, which is why we're getting these type of moves right now, which is why we'll probably test 350. And the high likelihood we go back up uh, and test the highs again. Well, let's uh, bring this conversation about demand to the very front end of the curve to money markets, because what, there's five point nine trillion dollars or so sitting in money market funds right now. That bid has just been unstoppable in 2023. Looking into 2024, do you think there's still going to be that really heavy, robust demand for cash? Uh, yeah, definitely. That bid will continue into Q1. 
I think that bid, as, as you stated, goes into fixed income um, because, um, you know, once people get their statements and see that bonds were actually up this year, which they are now, which is different from October, they'll feel more comfortable buying more bonds. And we think that's, that's like I said, a Q1 phenomena. And once that subsides, then the supply issue, and we still have inflation. We haven't even spoken about inflation. Right. Mm. You know, all those UAW wages, they kick in January. You know, government employees get a 5% plus increase in January. The defense bill that came out this week has a 5% <laughs> increase for service uh, persons. Um, there's a lot still there in the background, but uh, we're not focused on that now. And I understand that. And that's how the markets operate. Well, when it comes to the inflation picture, you think about the Fed's resolve to bring inflation back to 2%. It was interesting listening to Jerome Powell on Wednesday saying that so far the reduction in inflation, it's come without job losses. And then you think about the last mile of inflation, and he said that he's reluctant to say that that will be a painful process. Is that your read as well, and is that your read for the bond market? Uh, no, it, it will be a bit painful because that last drive down in inflation won't come unless unemployment goes higher. And the reason why that is, the two most sticky elements of inflation, which is keeping it above 3%, is one, wages. So as long as people are employed and the labor market's tight, which arguably structurally is, people will continue to, to get their paychecks, which adds to excess demand. And not only will they get their, their paychecks, based off of the strikes in 2023, they're more emboldened to ask for more money. That's one thing. The other thing too is, if they're employed, they're still going out and buying. Yes, they may be downgrading or going down to less expensive restaurants, but they're still spending. And that is directly related to employment. So soft landing assumes that in, uh, employment stays very high. Unemployment doesn't go that much higher, which means your services and wages are going to be extremely sticky. And it goes. One last thing I want to say, when I look at inflation, I look at the 70s. In the 70s, you had three peaks of inflation. The first one was roughly 6.2, call it, came down to three something, went back up to nine, came down, went back up to 14 before Volcker came in. We've just had one peak here. <laughs> so it's this is a secular trend. It's all not going to happen in 2024. It's not our expectation. But over the next three to five years, the, the grind is higher. Which uh, is going to be a lot of fun for people who are getting used to or not getting used to the whipsaw action. Earl, if you're looking at a band between three and a half percent and five percent, how do you play that? What do you do? Oh, great question. I love this question. You know what we're buying now? And we're, we and I've said this before, we're buying real yields. We're buying tips, 10 and 30 year tips. They're still 180 to 2% yields on backups. We love them because we think the financial conditions easing is a under underpins inflation, possibly pulls up, pushes up inflation expectations. So your real yields were outperform in that environment. So right now, we've been bearish for the past two years. You know, Quite honestly, we played the market from the bearish side. 2024, we're going to play from the bullish side because, until we touch the 350 level. Um, so on pullbacks, we will look to buy real yields is what we like. Um, and if you're thinking the opposite way, another thing we, we, we actually just did, we just shorted U.S. two-year bonds, discounting 165 basis points of eases by January, 150 by December. It's plausible. But we like that tailwind of being short. You actually make money if nothing happens. So we think that's a great tactical trade. A great structural trade is buying real yields and tips on the pullbacks. That's pretty bold to outright short two-year uh, yields. How do you do that without losing so much money uh, that it could really hurt returns? Well, think about it. When I say there's 165 basis points in eases discount in two-year bonds, that means they actually have to ease by more than that for you to lose money. And the other thing that, that's enticing about this is that it's discounting trade um, eases starting in March. So if they don't start March, even if it's summer or later, you make money additionally. So, you know, for, as a long-term investor and asset manager and an active manager, this is why it's so important to go into active management now because of these things. You have to say, where does the math make sense? Where does your forecast look? When it's different than the market expectations, that equals opportunity. So that's where we see opportunity tactically, which means it's a smaller size trade. Structurally, we like buying real yields on backups, and we still like credit. The economy is going to do extremely well and uh, resilient in 2024. So we like buying IG credit and triple B and, and picking away at some high yield as well. 
Earl Davis of BMO Global Asset Management. I love listening to what you have to say because it's always a bit counter consensus and bold. Earl Davis there from BMO. You're nodding along, Damien. Well, no, I, I agree with what he's saying on tips. I mean, certainly the move lower has been driven by real yields, not break evens. But, you know, I mean, IG credit, I mean, IG credit's up, what, 7% this year? I think high yield credit's up 11%, you know, in an environment where, you know, we're getting, if you think we're end of cycle, you know, and spreads haven't really reacted to that. Yeah, I, I don't know about that one, but look, you know, I'm, he's a braver soul than I. A braver soul, especially when it comes to the front end, outright shorting and the two year, two -year yeah. yields. Uh, it seems brave, but then you remember, of course, you still have that very lofty yield. You're still uh, clipping pretty meaningful coupons there. It would take a lot to lose a really, really painful amount of money. And just to sort of build on what you're talking about with investment grade credit and this question of whether spreads are too tight or how will you get value, investment grade bond spreads, the extra yield over benchmark rates, is the lowest level going back to January of last year. <laughs> Yeah. That's where we're at. It is less than 1% uh, above uh, the benchmark rates. That's amazing. It's tight. Well, and this is really uh, is going to set up our conversation. Coming up next, Michael Purvis of Talback and how much you play into the pivot party, how much you join, how much you bring someone, or how much you try to maybe leave early. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. I really wanted to pull back. I thought we'd have this great run, but as I look at what the Fed did, I think you have to keep these positions. I feel like the roles are a bit reversed now, where central banks are taking the big calls, and then the market is now running even farther ahead. I still think it's going to be dependent on the data. We are making this call that the earnings recession is likely over and that we're going to see rolling earnings recoveries. I just feel like we need to get through this bout of disinflation first before we talk about what happens next. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and and Lisa Abramowitz. Is it FOMO or no go? I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Mm. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrer are off, and of course, I'm misbehaving. Joining me, <laughs> I'm very glad to say, is Katie Greifeld and Damian Sassauer as we uh, plow toward the weekend after a crazy week. And honestly, I know it's cheesy, etc., but a lot of people are feeling FOMO right now. And then we just heard from Earl Davis, uh, maybe not. Yeah, leaning against it, outright shorting two-year treasuries. I'm still stuck on that, Damien. I know you're excited about uh, hips, tips and real yield call, but... I'm geez. not even thinking about, thinking about, even thinking about shorting two years in this market. <laughs> Why? I mean, God bless him. Well, okay, hold on a second. This idea of trying to lean against the freight train that is the fear of missing out. Give us a sense from all of the hats you've ever worn of how hard that is. Well, I mean, look, you got to think about things like carry. You got to think about the cost to short, right? And I mean, look, the two-year yield is not what it once was, right? So, you know, to hold that position on the mark-to-market -market losses you might get from the roll down is it just makes it a very difficult trade from a P&L perspective. Let's just reset here and talk about why we're talking about two-year yields. They are down from uh, recent highs on October 18th of 5.2%. They are currently 4.38%, almost 80 basis points of a decline in less than two months on the heels of what a lot of people said was a dramatic pivot from Fed Chair Powell, complete 180 in terms of his tone, really opening the door and solidifying the market's belief that the Fed will cut rates as early as March. March next year. Katie, how much can people move against this idea of immaculate disinflation of the fact that maybe it was just transitory when it's being basically supported by the Fed chair? You know, the question that I've been playing with over the past few days is uh, it seems like fighting the Fed actually worked this time, that uh, you had all of this rate cuts uh, pricing come into the market. You had Powell and company pushing back right up until the blackout period and then i don't know what we came to this wednesday it was a completely different fed chair yeah i mean last weekend when i was listening to bruce kasman and everybody out there i mean they were saying that all the talk was just how are they going to maintain a little bit of a hawkish tone amidst what's going to be a dovish meeting they didn't even try to no. maintain a hawkish <laughs> tone it was all doves all day all the time and it's just it took the market by surprise new york fed president john williams is going to be speaking in a bit but i am curious to see what the pushback is going to be heading into the end of the year whether we are going to see any kind of walk back. Without that, could anything change, Katie, heading into uh, an otherwise sleepy two mm. years, uh, two last weeks of the year? I want to say two years of the, two you know, years of epic. The year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's a great point because uh, how it typically happens, you get the press conference and then the weeks that follow, you have 
all of the FOMC members coming out, uh, all the Fed speak either endorsing that message or trying to walk it back, trying to fine tune it. Well, usually, I mean, you see, I mean, you would think that volatility would pick up given the level of uncertainty that's out there right now, but it's not. And quite frankly, if you look at history, it's not expected to. I mean, you usually get periods like this after that last hike, if, we're indeed, if we've indeed peaked, where you get this kind of, you know, kind of dribble down and vol for three to four to maybe even five months. If that's the case, it's it's risk on. Well, and vol has been going absolutely nowhere. Taking a look at the fixed <laughs> index, it's uh, close to the lowest going back to November 2019. Let's take a look at the scores right now. You can see the the gains retracing just a bit, maybe on the two-year call that we just heard from Earl Davis, 47.80, up about a tenth of a percent. The dollar giving back or actually uh, reclaiming some of its lost ground to the euro but still a pretty tremendous rally for the week for the euro. 109.42. Uh, this really, again, the divergence between central banks, a real question about how much people are actually buying it. I don't know, Damien. The fact that everyone's just completely discounted what ECB chair Christine Lagarde mm. was saying is notable. To well, me. I think it was the scarf, right? I mean, people really didn't buy into the scarf. I'm kidding. No, she, 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 she had a cold. She had a cold. I felt that for her. Yes, oh, she said she came out and she said, bear with me. Oh, I'm I didn't recovering know she from was COVID. Sick. Oh, okay, okay. And so she didn't I have the same kind of strength. She looked very chic. She looked great. Know, I, I like this. She I did, did too. look chic, but she didn't have the same kind of vigor. I didn't hear that. Sorry, Christine. What were you going to say? Yeah, no, I'm going to apologize. Well, you're going you're gonna to say something I just about think it? it's really interesting because, you know, see, central banks, especially developed market central banks, counter the Fed. You know, you, you're under, you, we're all living under this world where we think everyone follows the Fed. All central banks follow the Fed. But for the ECB to kind of take a bit of a different tact here, that stands out in my mind. And how long can they do that? Though? Yeah. The conversation we were having maybe an hour ago, mm -hmm. uh, they're breaking ranks right now. But uh, especially when you think about the, situ the economic situation over in the Eurozone, uh, at what point does that growth picture kind of force Christine Lagarde? Well, the ECB hand? doesn't care about growth, Katie. Remember, they're just, uh, they just target price. Correct. For well, now. And I think a lot of people aren't buying it. Turn and the Fed yields. doesn't target financial conditions either, by the way. 3.9%, <laughs> actually. They didn't seem to in this last press conference. Joining us now to weigh in on all of this, Michael Purvis, founder and CEO. CEO of Talback and Capital Advisors. Are you a FOMO kind of guy? Well, I am right now, certainly. Look, I think you, uh, Damien was talking in an earlier segment about the seasonals, and you absolutely have to look at them. When the market is up, what it was year to date into coming into the Q4, you could check a couple of boxes. Do earnings need to be pretty good? Yeah, they checked that box. Uh, did rates get contained when you know, the 10 year was spiraling up to 5% and possibly beyond? Sure, they got contained. You know, and, and add on to that a, a softer dollar, and you have you know, those three boxes checked. Then you have yes, uh, the FOMC. Um, yeah, and then you have a lot of uh, catch up. You have, you know, one of the things with all these crazy market movements is there's been a lot of positioning underneath this, right? A lot of people were, were way offsides uh, coming into this year, very bearish equities, perhaps bullish bonds, because there was the recession call. And we forget sometimes how important that is in sort of lifting those things. But for the here and now and to the year end, look, I, I think 4,800 is, 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 is uh, even, even life, you know, fresh lifetime highs of the S&P 500 is a real scenario here. I'm actually, you know, I've been bearish VIX coming into December, 12 handled VIX, then 11. I actually think we could see a 10 handled VIX. I'm trying to figure out what the volatility catalyst is between now and you know, the end of the year, you know, it's everyone's going to be going on vacation and, you know, any any kind of dip you're going to see, I think it's pretty well bought here. Well, let's talk about the VIX because you make a great point. The VIX is now just above 12, you know, levels of implied volatility have come off significantly. Sure. But you point out, interestingly, because I read all of your work, um, that realized vols come off all also quite significantly. Yeah. So the vol premium is still there for you to perhaps still want to write protection as opposed to buying protection. I'm curious, right. what's the move you want to make in this in this market right now if you want to get defensive? Am well, I buying puts or writing calls? Well, that's that's a great question. Actually, I think the best trade, I don't think it's I'm pulling the trigger on it just today, is is not SPY or SPX puts, um, but, but really rather VIX calls. Because I think what's going to happen, one of the things that's underlying this market dynamic is that there's a lot of rotation, right? And I think if you have rotation, you can see the S&P 500 being kind of like supported. You may not get the big down move that you need in SPY, SPY puts, but, you know, if, if the fix does get to 11, right, and, and you get some sort of just anxiety as we get through this sort of hangover from this rally, and, which is, I think, pretty, you know, inevitable, you know, in the late January, February time frame, you know, you don't need, you don't, you know, if you buy, a, you know, a VIX call, you know, at a buck, it can get to two, two, two and a half dollars pretty easily, whereas the SPX uh, put can just kind of melt away. And so I think yeah, that's my preferred way to play this. But I'm, again, I think I'd probably 
pulling that trigger in a few days. So Michael, conceptually that makes a lot of sense, but besides you potentially in a few days, besides uh, Damien, is anyone else hedging in this market? What does demand <laughs> for protection actually look like here? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of the, uh, the put call skew has, not, has failed to really you know, be elevated uh, through so much of this rally, uh, through so much of this year, uh, quite frankly, right? And, you know, you have seen this, you know, big growth in option usage there, and I think that's sort of an interesting structural component that has a lot of implications for distorting price action and mm -hmm. so forth, um, you know, on the day-to-day -day stuff. But, um, but look, you know, I think, you know, we haven't, you know, the VIX has uh, came through a period through some extraordinary events of COVID and then the Ukraine shock and then the most aggressive hiking cycle. And it's really been, you know, interestingly kind of leading the way down. One of the fascinating things I look at is the ratio of bond volatility to equity volatility. And I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to into next year really is rate volatility to really come down. And that's going to be, I think, a very constructive force to keep risk appetite strong. Um, well, next year. You're yeah. definitely speaking, I think, everyone's language, uh, looking at the move versus the VIX. And it's been interesting. I mean, the conversation for a lot of this year was uh, how do we see those two lines come back together? It seems as if the move is converging with the VIX has been the trend uh, for at least a few months now. If we see the move come in further, of course, that measure of bond volatility, I mean, you talk about 10 on the VIX. Is single digits, does that enter the conversation at all? Look, I, I, look, I mean, if you remember 2017, we had nine handle vixes i don't think I, I wouldn't say that um i think there's a there's always a lot of anxiety points here and i think we are getting overcooked here on this melt up just from a valuation point of view I'm, I'm actually very constructive on the broader outlook for next year but yeah no i mean generally vixes at that those levels are not sustainable hence my long vix um disposition uh there but i think one thing i want to make a point out on, on rate volatility is that you know you, you have, People think about the move index being jacked up because of this record hiking cycle. Sure, yeah, the, you know the velocity of hikes was was amazing and coming from a very dovish place to the, arguably one of the most hawkish places in the Fed's history. That transition was was created bond volatility, but you had that subsiding last summer just as term premium related volatility was coming in, and and I think both of those factors are obviously the rate hiking is is done, but now we have the term premium thing, which I still think is going to be higher, but the shock of that is 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 going to subside. Just quickly here, do you yeah. still expect the S and P to close next year at forty nine hundred as the high? Yeah, no, I, I do. I mean, that doesn't sound much from here, right? But I look no. at it as 4,900 for my current fair value is more like 4,300, uh, you know, there. So I think I sort of like to bench my fair value, future value relative to my current fair value estimate um, there. But I think there's actually, I may be, uh, we'll see how the year goes, but I think, I'm, you know, if some of the things happen, if AI starts kicking in a little bit and you see, you know, that kind of drive productivity gains, you could see well north of 4,900 here. I think Yardani's out with a 5,500 year end or something like that. And, and, and that? I, I, I don't, look, I, I, it's not nearly as crazy as it might sound. I think there's, there's a real upside there, um, there. But, you know, but to get from here to 4,900, let alone above 5,000, you're going to probably have to travel down to something you know, closer to what I think is fair value right now. But I think earnings are going to hold together between the Magnificent Seven, between nominal GDP supporting the everything else to a certain degree. And I think multiples have gone through a lot of their adjustment process to, you know, with this sort of higher, longer, you know, back end uh, interest rate condition. Michael Purvis of Tabak, and thank you so much. If you are just joining, we are seeing uh, the end of a week and on a high note, uh, the S&P up two tenths of a percent to 47.82. Katie, you were saying earlier, it's the path of how you get there. And that's what we just heard from Michael Purvis, just the same way we heard from Julian Emanuel. Of course, and you think about uh, you know, Emanuel's prediction there that, okay, maybe it's a rocky first half, but you think about where we'll be sitting a year from now, it seems like most of the consensus says it's gonna be bullish. Well, 5,500 on the S&P, I can only imagine what the market capitalization of Apple will be. <laughs> I mean, it's what, 3.1 trillion now? It's like, yeah. this country, it's like the size of France's market cap or something. Exactly. I mean, it's stupid. Well, it's, it's stupid until you see what they're actually doing. I keep going back to this. If you have to upgrade your phone or if you have a kid who broke their phone <laughs> and you have to go and you see all these people lining up for the privilege of paying $3,000 <laughs> for just various devices around the house to replace them. I mean, it just gives you a sense of how much cash they're actually generating. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's why these conversations around quality, you want to pay attention to the quality factor. You want to take a look at dividend uh, growers and dividend stocks there. Or you could take a look 
at Apple uh, and the incredible product mode that it has, all of the cash that it's sitting on, and uh, really can. It's a safe haven. It's exactly. got safe haven qualities to it. Exactly. No, I mean, I mean, I consider it to be a safe haven in my portfolio. I like to, I like to buy Apple as ballast for the rest of my portfolio. That's sure. Your bond. Sure. That's my fixed income allocation. Well, it's probably your money market allocation, considering <laughs> that all of its cash is currently in money market funds, earning five percent. Coming up at eight thirty a.m., Greg Dako, chief economist at EY, talking about the likelihood of a soft landing into bed for the weekend and into a year with an up, uh, uptick to the markets. Right now, that uptick continuing with a bid into bonds, with a bid into stocks. I don't think we'll see demand peaking in our lifetimes, particularly as EM demand growth continues uh, to, to surprise the upside. Let's not forget that the marginal cost of oil is going up, and that typically is the early leading indicator of an upcycle. It's just a matter of time before the market significantly tightens, and as the market tightens, we expect the second half of the decade will see a severe tightening. That is the point where the only real quantum of volume that we can rely on and lean into is OPEC. Christian Malik, Global Head of Energy Strategy at J.P. Morgan Securities, talking with a pretty nuanced brush about what to expect next year, especially given the surprise uh, declines in oil prices that we've seen this year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Katie Greifel, Damian Sassauer, John and Tom, both off. I'm looking right now at a Bloomberg Commodities Index that's down about almost 7% from mid-October. We're looking at oil prices. Crude traded on the NYMEX down from a high in September, a recent high of $93.68 uh, down to $72.09 currently uh, over in Brent Crude. If you take a look over there, you are seeing similar types of declines to currently trading uh, right now at $77.20. That lift continues in the S&P. I do wonder how much some of the rally that we have seen in bonds, in stocks, is underpinned by disinflation hopes fueled by lower energy prices. This can reverse pretty easily. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, terms of trade really haven't had all that much of an impact, certainly on currency movement and certainly on my markets, the emerging markets. And, and that's kind of unusual, right? Because if you look out over the whole of history, it's been the macro, it's been commodity prices, it's been oil, it's been copper that's driven valuations in many of these markets. And you just really haven't seen that in the last few years. What I find interesting about this leg lower that we've seen building uh, in oil in particular is what it means for energy equities, because that had yeah. really been the leader last in year. stock markets last year and the year before last year up 59% for the sector. It's down on the year. It's one of your biggest losers uh, in the stock market. So uh, when you think about the ripple effects here, it's really showing up in the equity market as well. It's also showing up at the airline stocks when you take a look at how much of a boom they've gotten, given the fact that that's one of their biggest input costs. To understand the trajectory forward, Will Kennedy joining us, I'm really glad to say, Bloomberg Senior Editor, Executive Editor uh, for Energy and Commodities. Will, how much has this underpinned the disinflation, this idea that for whatever reason, commodity prices are going down, even though demand isn't falling off a cliff. Yeah, it's uh, it's been quite a trend. And as you say, Lisa, quite a surprising trend that we've seen the oil prices uh, come off. And clearly, many policymakers will have been delighted to see it. I mean, it's been a huge focus of the Biden administration, and they um, will be very comfortable to see oil prices uh, back down where they are today. I mean, the question really is, uh, what happens next? And I think there's a a certain amount of uh, disagreement then. Well, I haven't really read through the IEA's um, expectations for oil demand in 2024, but obviously it's lower um, in terms of, well, it's 50% lower in terms of growth. So 1.1 million barrels a day growth next year versus 2.3 today. What's driving the downshift in growth? What regions? Is this China? Yeah, it is a China story, that, because the very strong number and over 2 million barrels a day is a very, very strong annual uh, growth is really driven by the fact that China was the last major market to emerge from COVID lockdowns. And there was a real spring back that juiced uh, oil demand more than you would typically expect. The 1.1 million barrels a day that we're going to see next year, according to IEA, is by historical standards a very, very healthy number. And interestingly, uh, although they were pretty downbeat on oil demand in the current period in the last quarter of this year, they slightly revised up their expectations for demand growth next year, uh, showing that, you know, despite all the economic uncertainties, um, demand does remain fairly strong. 
So, you know, Will, take me through this. You know, production cuts will see OPEX Plus's share of global oil supply fall to its lowest since that, uh, since OPEX Plus was first, you know, uh, created like seven years ago. Yet I'm seeing pictures of, you know, bro handshakes between, you know, Putin and MBS. You know, talk to me about Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 initiative. I mean, can they afford these production cuts? I mean, how long can they last and will they try to increase production in lieu of the current state of oil prices? We, um, we spoke with the Saudi energy minister a couple of weeks ago, and he was very firm in his belief that the action they took at the last OPEC meeting will be enough to rebalance the markets, that they looked long and hard at what the surplus looked like in the first part of this year, um, and that the cuts that they're going to deliver, the additional cuts they're going to deliver, will bring the uh, market back into balance. Moreover, he's seen there's willingness to keep cuts in place beyond the first quarter if they need it. Now, you make an important point, however, which is they are losing market share. And one of the most interesting things about the oil market this year, which has surprised people, is the strength of supply growth from America, from the shale industry. The shale industry has shown itself to be remarkably resilient. And when people expected it to slow, it hasn't slowed as much as possible. Whether they can sustain that next year will be fascinating to see. It's always the most important, uh, one of the most important things to look at when you understand the oil market. And clearly there's a risk for OPEC there is that you get into a vicious cycle where you reduce production to keep prices high and those high prices could encourage more production from shale. Um, so you keep stepping back on market share and that's something that happened almost 10 years ago where ultimately OPEC had to um, open the taps. Now, I don't think, talking to Saudi Arabia, they want to do that again at this stage, but there is clearly that danger. But their hope is these cuts and the additional cuts will be enough to bring the market back into balance and see prices rise. And well, I want to get a little bit existential here and really zoom out because, of course, we're coming out of the COP28 summit. Of course, one of the big news uh, pieces from that summit was the first U.N. deal to really ditch fossil fuels forged at this summit. What are people in the market, what are oil executives, et cetera, thinking about long term what demand for oil looks like? Yeah, I mean, it was a historic uh, agreement, and there were lots of people who are cynical about COP, but it does signal a bit of a direction of travel. It does signal that you have every country in the world signing a document saying that the world economy needs to transition away, transition away from fossil fuels. That's a pretty remarkable thing. But it is it is quite long-term in nature, and, and it won't happen overnight. I think one of the other significant things, though, was that there was a mention of transition fuels, which uh, I think is a code word for gas. And I think the oil and gas industry is thinking, yes, EVs mean that oil demand will peak at some point. People argue about how soon that's coming. But let's say, for the example, you know, by the end of this decade, oil demand may have peaked. I don't think people think that gas demand is going to peak. The gas industry was very present at COP. The gas industry presents itself as a way to get coal out of the system and replace it with a gas which emits less carbon dioxide. So that side of the industry is quite bullish. So I think one of the things that underpins is this trend that we've seen for some time, which is the oil and gas industry to be more gassy. Well, we'll just sitting on this thought a little bit longer. So point taken that when you think about the demand side, this is something that's going to probably take place over decades, if at all. But talk to us about where supply could actually come from. It's interesting. You think about the U.S. involvement uh, in this deal and you think about the fact that U.S. production has really surged. I mean, how long term do you think that uh, push that U.S. push to increase production will last? Well, Shale always tends to uh, supplies on the upside, but I think most people think that shale will not grow forever, that the growth rates that we see in the future will be slower than those in the past. Clearly, the financial structure of the shale industry has changed a bit with less emphasis on production growth and more emphasis on actually making money, and I think that trend will continue. And if we look more broadly, Christian Malik at the start of this conversation made a very important point. People aren't investing as much in new production as they used to. There is going to be a crunch point down the line if that trend continues. And I think one of the things to say about coal is it sends a signal that maybe investing in the long-term projects that oil requires, sort of 10, 20-year uh, returns, um, billions of dollars, you're going to be reluctant to do that if this transition is going to happen. So one of the important things about this COP28 deal is it's likely to keep investment in new oil fields suppressed below historical level, which does mean 
that we could see markets get tight. Will Kennedy, thank you so much for being with us at a time where oil has been some of the most counterintuitive uh, areas of the market, just everything in the complex. I want to bring this to you from Neil Dutta, who came on the show yesterday, who has been bullish and has been right. And he said, you know, yesterday we had the fourth highest percent of overbought readings in the SPX since 1990s, has since 1990. Guess what? This overbought is historically bullish. Huh. A lot of people might take that as a contrarian, but uh, you think about one of the ultimate contrarians, and it's Neil Dutta. Well, Neil's been right, so we have to listen to him, right? <laughs> well, you can do what you want to do, but what it basically shows is you can come up with all these indicators, but ultimately, they mean something different yeah. to other people. Some people say, well, exactly. it's a sign to sell. Other people say, keep on buying. <laughs> Coming up, Greg Daco of EY. This is Bloomberg. Exciting things. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. We are seeing a bit of a lift to market after a really a massive <laughs> week of gains, particularly for the small caps, particularly for the bank stocks. Uh, just taking a look at the Russell 2000 up almost four tenths of a percent. Uh, that's down from earlier, about eight tenths of a percent. But those shares up more than five percent on the week. If you look at the KBW index of bank stocks, those shares are up by <laughs> more than 9% at this point, if you take a look at futures on the week. Honestly, it's just a real melt up in Katie. That's what we heard. It's basically why fight it if there's no reason for anyone to sell. Let go, let God just accept that. Uh, we are looking at a pretty booming equity rally right now. Of course, tepid gains at the moment, but you think about on a weekly basis, this is the seventh straight week of gains, which is pretty Astonishing. That's the longest streak in quite a number of years. And the seventh straight day of gains as well. So I, I don't remember the last time we've seen seven straight equity market up days in a row. It's been quite a while, I think. It's quite a number, seven, on many levels, where it's also been fueled by the bond market. The yield's going lower pretty substantially, particularly uh, in the two-year space, 4.4%, though marginally up now. The 10-year space getting as low as 3.9%. Now, 3.91%. Uh, Honestly, these moves just just massive. And you brought up a really good question, Damien, earlier, which is what does that do to the structure of a market mm. that is not built for whipsaw action like this? Well, the question I have is what part of the curve do you want to look at here, right? What's going to give you the most information? Is it twos, tens? Is it three month, 10 year? Is it two year, 30 year? Like everyone's talking about a normalization of the yield curve, a steeper U.S. yield curve. But at which point, at which tenor points? I mean, that's the that's where I, I, I kind of dig in my heels. Yeah, what's going to drive that? I would imagine that's one of the big trades to talk about in 2024. What happens to that yield curve and in what way does it normalize? Is it that bull steepener? Do you see two year yields really drive this? Uh, for a while, it looked like uh, it was the, just the tenure going up that could get us back to positive, but right. it feels like a long time ago. Or do you just outright short two years, uh, two year <laughs> yields like Earl Davis? Meanwhile, you do see the euro uh, lower just a bit versus the dollar as people take a look at some weaker than expected economic data out of the region. 109.42. Under surveillance this morning, China ramping up stimulus to support the ailing property sector. The country's central bank handing out $112 billion in one-year loans to commercial lenders. Beijing and Shanghai also relaxing home buying restrictions to ease the housing downturn. The news coming as concern mounts and it has been mounting for the world's second largest economy. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Jenny Yellen announcing that she is planning yet another visit to China in 2024. Damien, I know this is your bailiwick. How much is the promise of stimulus really outstripping what China can actually deliver? Well, it's, it's outstripping for sure. I mean, there was an unconfirmed report overnight also that China is going to actually allow its budget deficit to expand to as much as 3% of GDP. I mean, that's got the markets fired up as well. So, you know, certainly all investors, myself included, are just looking and looking and hoping and waiting for stimulus out of the PBOC. And if we start to see a lot more of that, yeah, I mean, things could really ramp up in a, I mean, look, 5,500 in the S&P, I don't know, but you could definitely see a risk on mood. So that's what's going on over in China. Over in the U.S., the Senate delaying its holiday break as aid for Ukraine hangs in the balance. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying negotiations will continue in hopes they can pass a bill next week. House Speaker Mike Johnson has repeatedly said Ukraine aid cannot pass without a deal on immigration. The House has already left Washington for its holiday break. And Katie, honestly, to me, this is one of the most undertold stories of the past month. People have been so focused on Israel Hamas that they haven't been focusing as much on the Ukrainian war and what's going on with the fact that if they don't get funding, is that essentially handing the victory 
to Russia. Especially, too, when you layer on the fact what's going on in the U EU, uh, of course, not being able to uh, produce uh, some aid package there. It's interesting, though, to see this playing out in Congress. I mean, when it comes to the Democratic side, President Joe Biden, he has offered some compromises on U.S. border policy, but you think about how dug in these two sides are, what the eventual compromise will look like, hopefully being hammered out in January. It's going to be interesting. Well, I'll say what's also interesting is the House is left for the holidays, but the Senate is still there, right? I mean, so okay. it's interesting that Chuck Schumer's kept them back and they're trying to get things planned for the beginning of January. Let's see when they decide to uh, actually throw down the gauntlet with the House. Meanwhile, this is the story that we actually wanted to get to. I'm sure you both have thoughts. Apollo and Blackstone getting into the holiday spirit with their annual videos. Oh, my. <laughs> Apollo's uh, features <laughs> chief economist Horses Slock dressed as an elf. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> Blackstone going right, all Scott. in on its fandom of Taylor Swift. Senior staff lip syncing about the firm's, quote, alternatives era. CEO Steve Schwartzman even wearing a shimmery jacket similar to the one Swift wore to sing Karma. Thoughts? Who wants to start? I have two thoughts. I'll start with Apollo. I think Torsten Slock has to be the tallest elf there ever was. I don't know if that was quite believable. And then uh, on the Blackstone... That's the only thing that was really a problem. That was the, that okay. was the only thing uh, I'll say there. On the Blackstone video, I know a lot of people did not like this. I saw a lot of snarky tweets, to put it mildly. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it, but okay. I mean, John Gray in the mosh pit, you're right, Schwartzman with the you know, sequins and the whole jacket. I mean, for guys who are managing that much money to see them having so much fun and talking about Taylor Swift concerts, it kind of, you know... Should they not have fun? That's, no, that's exactly I know. They're I not supposed say. to be fun. They're supposed to make us money, right? No, exactly. I, well, I mean, this is the whole, like, Instagram era and TikTok era. If you're going to mm. do marketing, who do you want to get? You want to get the Taylor Swift fans and you want to get in Although on, I did, I, you know, I appreciated that seeing that other side of them. I mean, they're always so serious every time John Gray and I go after drinks. I mean, it's nice to see him let, it, let down his guard a little bit. Are you trying to basically come back after basically saying no? No, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Honestly, we're talking about it, and that's probably the point. So uh, I guess a win it on works. that front. It worked. It exactly. Works. If they're looking for publicity. Right now, what we are looking for is just some sign in the data of confirmation of uh, the disinflation narrative. It felt like a very hard pivot there. I do want to bring you this. We did just get Empire Manufacturing uh, moments ago. Coming in way below expectations, declining 14.5% versus mm. the expectation of increasing about 2%, uh, 2%. Uh, percent. The prior reading was 9.1%, so just a sense that we are seeing some sort of slowdown. Joining us around the table, Greg Daco, chief economist at EY. Do you think that hopes and dreams of immaculate disinflation have gotten overblown and that there is this concern about a slowdown that's steeper than people are pricing in? Well, I think we have to be nuanced when we analyze the economic landscape. We are in an environment where we are seeing slower economic activity. I think there's no denying that, uh, whether it's on the consumer side or on the business side, we have seen a slowdown in terms of the pace of growth. So it's not immaculate disinflation. We've seen the supply come back online. That's helped with the, the, the inflationary picture. And we're seeing moderating demand, which is also putting downward pressure on inflation. So it's not immaculate. And I think as we look into next year, that's going to be continuing to drive inflation lower, whether it's rent disinflation, slower momentum in terms of growth activity, even wage growth compression, and the fact, let's not forget, that the Fed is still maintaining a restrictive monetary policy stance. Combine all of those and you have all the right ingredients for a disinflationary environment. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, sentiment a little bit, because uh, we've been talking about uh, this morning the fact that you think about the U.S. consumer and you take a look at these sentiment surveys and it has just been grim out there for years now. And when you think about inflation, yes, we're in this disinflationary environment, but the outright level of prices is still much higher than it was. Do we need to see actual deflation to see some of those sentiment numbers pick up? I think you're alluding to the most important point uh, when it comes to the inflationary dynamics, because we talk about inflation. Economists, policymakers, we all talk about inflation. But what matters for the average person, whether it's the consumer or the business leader, is the cost level. The cost fatigue phenomenon is very real. The cost of everything is much higher than it was pre-pandemic, whether it's goods, services, labor, inventory, even interest rates. Everything is much higher, costs much more. That is leading to business decisions being pulled back and being more scrutinous about how much to invest. It's leading consumers to be more careful about how many goods, how many services they buy, even though they're spending a little bit less. And I think that's the very important narrative that's going to be really underlying the pace of growth next year is how sensitive people are to this higher cost of, cost of everything environment and how the labor market reacts. Let's not forget, 
the labor market is the key pillar to economic activity. Greg, the dot pot's calling for 75 bips of cuts. I think the market's priced in 140 bips, bips of cuts. It's a pretty big divergence there. You know, talk to me about the why. Is disinflation enough of a reason for the Fed to cut rates in 2024? Well, yeah, I think the key reason why the Fed will be adjusting rates is because it sees less inflation. Last time I was on the show, I was talking about the fact that we have the holy grail of non-inflationary growth in front of us. We have an economy that's still moving forward, but inflation that is moderating. That is what the Fed wants. The Fed does not want a recession. It wants to see inflation come back down to 2% and become a non-issue, a non-topic, something that we don't talk about every day on this show or on other uh, platforms. This is really what the Fed is aiming for. So whether it comes to the Fed's forecast being realized or the market expectations being realized, I think the truth in the end will lie somewhere in between, probably 100 and 125 basis points of rate cuts by the end of next year with an environment where inflation is gradually slowing and we don't enter recession. If we enter a recession, the picture and the game is going to be quite different. Greg, off the air, Lisa and I always like to talk about real yield. She likes the five-year. I like the 10-year personally. 10-year real yield, 1.88% down 60 basis points since October. How low can real yields go? Well, I think that's the, the key question for next year is going to be what happens in terms of growth momentum, what happens in terms of inflation momentum, and how rapidly does the Fed ease monetary policy. That is what Fetcher Powell and the rest of the Fed officials are going to be focused on. They're going to be focused on ensuring that real yields don't rise. They do not want to be tightening in the face of a slowdown in final demand, in the face of a slowdown in inflation. So they're going to be recalibrating monetary policy gradually. I think the March rate cut calls right now are a bit extreme. They're going to be making sure that inflation is really sustainably on this trajectory of lower inflation, and then recalibrate to the downside gradually with 25 basis point increments to start with. Meanwhile, I do want to just bring this to you. Uh, New York Fed Chair uh, John Williams has been speaking, and he said that the market is reacting maybe more strongly than forecasts show, and also said, we aren't really talking about rate cuts right now, as Neil Dutta over at Renaissance uh, just commented. Sorry, but you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. There is, however, a market response. We are seeing bond yields rise, uh, two-year yields uh, rising to about 4.46%, uh, 10-year yields uh, spiking upward to about uh, 3. 0.96%. This raises a question, Greg. Do you think that they are getting concerned about the easing in financial conditions beyond what Jay Powell seemed to indicate yesterday? I think when people say that the easing of financial conditions is going to reignite growth and reignite inflationary pressures, I tend to be a little bit more cautious. First of all, as we were just talking, we have to factor in the fact that maybe market expectations are a bit too strong. Fed policy communication is going to recalibrate that market perspective. Number two, let's not forget, as we just talked about, cost fatigue and labor market developments are going to be the key drivers of economic activity, not so much rates. And then number three, and this is very important, we are in an environment where there is less rate sensitivity. There was much less rate sensitivity on the upside. We should expect to be a little bit less rate sensitivity on the downside as well. All three factors mean that we have to be a little bit more nuanced when it comes to the economic picture. Greg Daco, wonderful as always to catch up with you. Happy holidays. Always a pleasure. Happy holidays. Greg Daco of EY. If you are just joining uh, right now, you can see the S&P has actually turned negative on the heels of these comments, down about a tenth of a percent. Uh, Ten-year yields markedly higher, about five basis points higher, 3.97%. We do have to pick up there, this idea that uh, John Williams, the uh, president of the New York Fed, coming out saying we aren't really talking about rate cuts right now. The knee-jerk reaction is to just reverse, Katie, what we saw over the past uh, couple of days. I think we should all feel very vindicated because we were talking <laughs> about this about an hour ago that now the uh, either the fine-tuning, the pushback, or the endorsement starts to see uh, John Williams come out and say, we aren't really talking about it. We have the receipts. We know that Jerome Powell said on Wednesday that the Fed not only talked about it, but they discussed the timing of rate cuts at the meeting this week. Uh, so it's interesting. After a week Empire survey too, huh? Yeah. So uh, it's kind of convenient. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, I mean, like if you really believe that, you know, I mean, that he needs to walk this back a little bit, which everybody does. I mean, the one thing you can't walk back are financial conditions here in the U.S. And, you know, the fact that the Fed has come and explicitly said that they are watching that means that they are watching everything from spreads to equities to the dollar. And so it's not just inflation and growth anymore. It's 
it's a lot more than that. And you can see that it's a pretty direct knee-jerk reaction. Just taking a look at Fed funds futures, right now they're pricing in about a 72% chance of a Fed rate cut in March. So still solidly pricing that in yesterday, uh, about the same, but we saw that kind of idea of a knee-jerk reaction, get that up to close to 9% at one point. So, I mean, 90%, excuse me. Coming up on The Open, Keith Lerner of Truist, Marilyn Watson of BlackRock, and Max Kettner of HSBC as everyone frantically rewrites their year-ahead outlooks, or maybe not. Maybe they just say it's just a matter of timing and it's going to be bumpy and we can expect another year like the one we've been having. That's coming up next. Chair Powell put the rate cuts on the table because he wanted the markets to start to lower these long-term real interest rates. Uh, and, and, and it gives him time to slowly adjust the Fed funds rate, probably wait until spring or summer before actually starting the implementation of the stuff, of, of, the, of the rate cuts. And that way, I think he can smoothly navigate that real rate down. All right, that was Bill Lee. He is chief economist over at the Milken Institute, talking to us just a little bit earlier on Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, John Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Uh, Tom and John, they're off this week. Lisa is uh, on her way to the open, so it's just you and me. It's just you and me. Yeah. No, isn't that how it should be, right? <laughs> talking about the pass through from U.S. Treasuries into broader risk markets, talking about equities, commodities. Everything was ramping just until a few minutes ago. Just until a few minutes ago. And let's talk about why things changed. Of course, we are hearing from the Fed's John Williams coming out with some comments on the heels of hearing from his boss two days ago saying that Fed's Williams, we aren't really talking about rate cuts and that it would be premature to be thinking about a March rate cut. A lot of interesting things there because we heard something a little bit different from Jerome Powell just two days ago. Well, we should be patting ourselves on the back because at the beginning of the hour, we were talking about, we're not even thinking about, thinking about, hopefully thinking about rate cuts. And here comes John Williams to the rescue saying exactly that. So yeah. I think we had to walk some of these things back. I mean, the markets were just getting far too bit ahead of themselves here. Yeah, and we're definitely going to spend some time on these comments uh, in our conversation coming up. But taking a quick look at the market right now, you take a look at S&P 500 futures turning a hair negative, nothing too dramatic there. You take a look uh, at the euro dollar also down on the day. Ten-year yields reversing a little bit here, uh, up about three basis points. But still, we're talking about very, very low levels here, Damien. Yeah, no, very low levels. But I think, look, at, at the end of the day, this is more than just a rate story. It's about currencies as well, right? I mean, there was a big move against the dollar for the better part of the last few weeks. And now we're starting to see that reverse as well. And so if we do indeed see a little bit of compression between Europe and the U.S., we're going to see euro dollar come off here. I never forget the currency market, but I can rest assured that you will never let me forget <laughs> no, the I'll currency market. No, I'll never forget. Yeah, exactly. you're, all, you're all about it. Uh, let's get to some of the individual movers, though, in the pre-market session. There's a few interesting ones here. I wanted to start with General Motors. GM there. You can see not too much of a move right now. This stock has been interesting, though, because, uh, of course, the news this week, GM to cut more than 1,300 jobs at two plants in Michigan. It's been a really interesting, a really tough time for the automakers recently. Well, yeah, and, and obviously, you know, they the cruise, I, th I forget the name, um, they're, they're autonomous driving, uh, cruise, yeah. right, right? I mean, they've invested, what, seven, almost a three quarters of a billion dollars in it in the last quarter alone. And now they're talking about layoffs. And I think they expected to see something in the order of a billion in revenue by 2025. And good luck seeing that. I think 50 billion by 2030. I mean, those are huge, huge numbers for them to be having layoffs now tells you a little bit about what's going on there. And you think about the big three still uh, dealing with the impact, the fallout from those uh, six week long strikes. Uh, sure. Definitely one to watch. Let's move on here, though, uh, to some of the other movers as well. We do have Lennar. This is an earnings story. This home builder, it reported yesterday after the bell. It's declining right now. Weaker gross margin. The forecast was disappointing as well. You can see shares currently off by about 3.6% right now. Uh, home builders, when you think about what's going on in the housing market, just the total freeze there for a while, it was benefiting to uh, home builders. But now the story's changed a little bit. Well, home builders have absolutely ripped in the last few weeks, right? So it's, it's understandable to see a little bit of a pullback here. But, you know, in terms of rate sensitive 
equity sectors. I mean, the home builders are probably number one, right? So mm -hmm. if you really do believe that, you know, hey, I mean, we're going to test the lower end of the 3% handle in 10 years, you know, the home builders should be a pretty good play there, Katie. I know that mortgage rates slip below uh, 7%, but we're still talking about 7%. Yeah, it's so high. It's still so high. Yeah, yeah somebody out who was very close to me who knows the market really well said 5.5% is the magic number. That's when we start to see some movement? Uh, it should be when, you know, you're going to start to see things shake up and supply sort of come online. All right, so we'll keep receipts on that one. But uh, just quickly, let's also talk about Roku here. Not having a great moment morning down about three percent this coming on the heels of a downgrade uh to sell from neutral that's at moffitt nathanson uh analyst there saying that uh basically the company was getting more focused on efficiency and margin expansion but at over a hundred dollars per share now roku's share price has nearly doubled since then uh so really a victim of its own success at least in the equity market uh behind that downgrade but let's get back to what we're seeing uh in the bond market in the equity market right now, driven by these comments from John Williams. Let's welcome in Megan Swiber. She is director of U.S. rate strategy over at Bank of America. And this feels how it usually goes. Of course, you have Jerome Powell come out at these Fed meetings and then Fed speak happens and tend to walk it back. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Katie. We had just such a prominent rates market response to Powell's very dovish comments here. And so we were actually flagging some of this in our, in our in our recent publication. It seems like the market's in for a bit of a consolidation here. And I think that William's comments really endorse that. One of the things, though, that we see borne out in a lot of the indicators that we look at, though, is we had positioning largely long coming into some of these moves that we got. So in rates in particular, that's an area where we can see investors covering profit taking alongside some of these recent moves as well. Well, I mean, Kitty says that I never like to not talk about currencies. So I'm going to talk about <laughs> currencies here because you talk about currencies. We're talking about dollar yen here. I mean, that's one of your trades, right? You do believe that there's more downside to dollar yen at current levels. But I look at rate differentials and I say, wow, look at those rate differentials. To put that trade on, my goodness, you're going to be bleeding on a P&L basis. How do you put that type of trade on? How do you play that in the market? So, so this is actually something that we're seeing a lot in the FX and rate sentiment survey that we conduct at, at B of A. Generally, investors are, are short dollar and the way that they're kind of playing this, of course, course is against the, the yen. Uh, and we think that that positioning is really quite stretched right now. So ahead of some of these adjustments that we see coming from the BOJ, we think that the preferred way to do this is, is in, in short JGBs rather than uh, to play this in the currency market because of some of that stretched positioning that we see. No, no, I don't disagree. But then you also have, I mean, look, if, if forget about dollar yen, you've got Mex peso yen, right? I mean, look at Mex peso. It's one of the few currencies that's really been kind of off relative to the whole of every other currency mm -hmm. with the dollar, you know, because it kind of tracks the dollar. You know, talk to us about that dynamic, you know, the fact that, you know, you've got currencies like the Mexican peso that tend to track the mm. dollar in certain environments, Cur currencies like the Japanese yen that tend to track the dollar in risk off environments. How do you kind of manage through that when you're a fixed income investor? So I think that what the real impetus that we see for a lot of this divergence in positioning is just that conviction about the Fed path which is actually another thing that we see borne out in, in the survey is that investors are long rates and, and short dollar, but ultimately alongside that there is some skepticism around how much is the Fed ultimately going to cut. Uh, investors generally thinking that if there's one central bank that can surprise a little bit more so to the hawkish side versus expectations, it could indeed be the Fed. And I think that it really comes down to this message that they've been delivering, which is data dependence. The market understands their reaction function now, that they want to be cutting alongside this progress in PCE inflation. Uh, and so that's why we've gotten this such sharp recalibration. But the Fed has really done such a heel turn on this that there's, there's risk that they can do that again. Well, let's talk about the dispersion of potential outcomes here, because you have the dot plot penciling in, what, 75 basis points of cuts next year. Then you have the market at 150 basis points. Where do you fall in between that? So we've been long uh, coming into this, you know, this most recent rate rally. I want to say the year because we wrote our year aheads in, in November. But but it really has been almost a year and in a month in terms of some of this price action. So we had been recommending investors trade long, tr trade long the five-year sector in particular, because that's the point on the curve that can not just be sensitive to just what the timing is of cuts near term, but also this trough of the Fed cutting cycle. So when we look at market pricing versus the dot plot, um, what we see is the market is, is certainly overpricing the extent of cuts versus what the Fed has endorsed. But what we, what we see also on the flip side is that the market's pricing a higher trough of the Fed cutting cycle than ultimately what the Fed is telling us, right? We look at the dot plot suggesting that the Fed's going to get to below 3%. That's where they think neutral is. 
Um, but the market's still very reluctant to price that. And I think it really is driven by some of the uncertainty that we still see in the inflation market. And the fact that we, we, we were not really seeing broad-based weakness elsewhere and trying to get a better sense of what is it that's going to cause the Fed to really cut more aggressively mm -hmm. and bring rates back down to something that they think is, is that neutral rate. So we've been long. We've taken that, that position largely off because of the, the very sharp performance that we've observed. And now we're being a little bit more tactical, you know, managing some of the opportunities that we see headed into next year, but are, are roughly neutral at this point. All right, Megan, uh, great to check in with you, especially to get your live reaction to these comments from John Williams that are moving the markets right now. That is Megan Swiber of Bank of America. And uh, Damien, I mean, we've been joking that not too much going on, but Fed speak, you can always rely on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, I mean, I think the real big question, I mean, we know that it's going to be the Fed and Treasuries, the pass through into broader risk assets in 2024. That's still going to be the story. The question is, which direction do we go? Is it going to be a hard landing or a soft landing? Because the implications of that have so... Uh, so far reaching across all asset classes and that's really going to be the focus you know is it going to be a recession or not all right well the year is not over yet and neither is the day coming up on bloomberg tv at 2 30 p.m we have nicholas bailey president and ceo of remax holdings on his outlook for the housing market in 2024 thank you for tuning in this is bloomberg